Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Technology. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or to silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology, and I want to welcome everyone to our hearing. Today, we will focus on the ethical implications of using artificial intelligence or AI and automated decision systems or ADS and how to best use such systems to promote fairness, transparency and expand opportunity. Uh, the committee will also hear intro number 1894 uh, in relation to the sale of automated employment decision tools. The committee expects to receive testimony from Jeff Thamidi Kazam, sorry Jeff, Director of the Mayor's Office of Operations, Brittany Saunders, Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Human Rights Commission, John Paul Farmer, Chief Officer, Chief Technology Officer of the City of New York, as well as advocates, academia, industries, and other uh, interested members of the public. Today, breakthroughs using AI and big data allow ADSs to make many decisions like who gets a loan, uh, who gets a job, uh, gets promotions, what stocks to buy, and more. And use of ADS, however, uh, uh, is not limited to the private sector. ADSs are making their way to many areas from criminal justice and education to public safety and beyond. Uh, for instance, city agencies use algorithm to assist uh, officials in predicting where crimes may occur, placing students uh, in public schools, and scheduling building inspections and other operations. Uh, the New York City Administration uh, of uh, Children's Services has been using a software that helps strengthen investigations of possible child abuse and neglect by automatically identifying and flagging high-risk cases that need additional review by managerial staff. Uh, the New York City Department of Education has been using a school assignment algorithm to assign students to schools. The New York City Fire Department has been using the risk-based inspection system and Oracle-based program with data mining capabilities to better anticipate where fires may occur by organizing data from five city agencies. And the De New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development has an initiative to use specific predictive analytics to identify at-risk buildings uh, that endanger the health and safety of residents. So, um, you know, terms such as machine learning algorithms and big data are often associated with fair, calculated, and unbiased decision making. However, we are continually learning from research and lawsuits that this notion often does not hold and that algorithm decisions can, at times, produce biased and discriminatory outcomes. This is especially worrisome when, you, when considering how AI and ADSs are rapidly expanding in our society. For instance, in 2017, a career builder survey found that 55% of US human resources managers said artificial intelligence would be a regular part of their work within the next five years. Now, just three years later, with more employees working remotely, during this COVID-19 pandemic, the use of automated decision hiring tools is more pronounced than ever. Platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams are used for conducting virtual uh, job interviews. As we know, employers are using these AI technologies to scan resumes for keywords, uh, assess candidates' uh, public profiles for indicators of certain personality traits and scan video interviews to evaluate the candidate's behavior and mannerisms. There are many examples on how artificial intelligence systems, even when well-intentioned, 
may adversely uh, affect uh, individuals. For instance, in February 2020, a study by Google AI researchers tried to, to give disadvantaged groups easier access to loans. However, it ended up reducing their, or I'm sorry, yeah, it ended up reducing their credit scores, which is you know, hard to believe, but this is the, this is the dangers here. Uh, Amazon created an automated hiring tool that they had to discard because it learned to discriminate against female candidates in favor of male candidates. So you see uh, there is a problem. Data scientists are also facing problems in quantifying fairness uh, in these systems because of how complex it is. So automated decision systems should not disproportionately impact people based on age, race, religion, gender, disability, and more. Therefore, without transparency and a close examination of such, such systems, the benefits could be negated by certain risks, discrimination and unfair practices. So to ensure transparency and accountability in ADS hiring tools, the following bill will be considered. Uh, introduction 1894 by Majority Leader Lori Combo in relation to the sale of automated employment decisions tools. Um, I'd like to recognize my colleagues. Uh, in addition to Lori Combo, we have uh, Councilmember Yeager and Councilmember Ballone. Um, I'd also like to thank our technology committee staff, Irene Bahofsky, the, the policy analyst, Charles Kim, the finance analyst Florentine Cabor uh, for their all their hard work in preparing for this uh, hearing. Uh, also, my, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Daniel Cosina, and communications and legislative director, Kevin Ryan. Uh, I would like to now turn over uh, to my colleague, Majority Leader Lori Combo, to deliver an opening statement on her bill, Intro 1894. Sergeant, can we uh, unmute her? Laura, can we get? All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Holden, so much for holding this hearing today and for all of the interested parties who have come forth to testify and to our le legislative division for their continued collaboration with my entire team. According to research conducted by the Oracle Corporation in coordination with the HR Research Institute, 10% of all organizations have already integrated some form of artificial intelligence into their human resources department, with another 36% planning to incorporate within the next couple of years. This is a trend that is happening that we need to be aware of, and we need to understand how it's impacting our workforce. Furthermore, black and brown people continue to suffer at the hands of systemic racism within a job market that continues to discriminate, most especially based on race and gender. A study conducted by the Harvard Business Review between 1990 and 2017 found that on average, white applicants receive 36% more callbacks than black applicants and 24% more callbacks than Latino applicants with identical resumes. Something must change to address the disparities which exist in current hiring processes. As legislators in a city home to some of the world's largest corporations, we must intervene and prevent unjust hiring practices that have left talented professionals at the mercy of a system that has been designed to perpetuate systems of inequality. My bill intro 1894 provides the legal framework to regulate our hiring systems in some of our country's top companies and organizations. We're talking about the Googles, the Amazons, and the Apples of the world. Not only would this require tech companies that produce and sell such instruments to conduct annual bias audits, but it would also require organizations who utilize these tools to notify each candidate within 30 days of screening of the specific tools used to evaluate them in addition to the qualifications or characteristics considered by the algorithm. Artificial intelligence is a technology that is still being developed and understood. However, as technology continues to evolve, 
the government must rise to the occasion and produce legislation that protects our constituents' right to employment based on qualifications, not identity. This legislation is merely another opportunity for the council to explore how artificial intelligence will affect our lives. And again, I wanna thank council uh, member and chair Holden for hosting this very important hearing today. Um, it's really important that we address um, how artificial intelligence is going to be utilized to help and support and assist all people so that we can ensure that we have equality in all forms of our hiring practices. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Counsel Irene Bahofsky, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Holden, and thank you, Councilmember Combo. I am Irene Bajavsky, the Counsel to the Committee on Technology, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify. At which point, you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimonies from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions of the administration or specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you. Call you. you will, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Also, please note that all panelists, aside from those from the administration, will be limited to a three-minute time timer so that we may easily accommodate all who have registered to testify. When, we're, when you are called to testify, please state your name and organization you represent. We will next call representative, representatives of the administration to testify. I will, we will be hearing testimonies from New York City Chief Technology Officer, John Paul Farmer, Director of the Mayor's Office of Operation, Jeff Tamtiki Kassam, and Deputy Commissioner of New York City Commission on Human Rights, Brittany Saunders, will also be present to answer questions. At this time, I will administer the, admi the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on you individually for response. Please, you, please raise your right hand. Okay. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. John Farmer. I do. Thank you. Jeff T. I do. Ms. Saunders. I do. Thank you. I will now invite New York City Chief Technology Officer, John Paul Farmer to present his testimony. Before we begin, Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Mr. Farmer, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Paul Farmer, New York City Chief Technology Officer. Good afternoon, Chair Holden and committee members. I'm pleased to join you today as the council explores the role of artificial intelligence or AI and the automated decision tools that continue to gain prevalence and influence decision-making processes and practices that impact New Yorkers. As you realize, employing these systems can offer benefits to New Yorkers, bringing about efficiencies and improving outcomes for our residents. As with other technology tools, without careful application and guidance, these tools may also cause unintended harms. The city shares the council's interest in preventing any harms that may result from application of these technology tools and sees this as part of a multifaceted effort to advance the concept of digital rights for New Yorkers, building on existing human rights and privacy rights. Today, I'll share with you the technology context 
or the AI tools under discussion, update you on the status of the ethics conversations on these technologies, illustrate the city's efforts to prevent harms, including advancing the concept of digital rights and creating a framework for managing government use of algorithms. And I'll discuss future protections needed to balance the risks. Now, there are a number of overlapping terms that can sometimes create confusion. So permit me to clarify a few points. An algorithm is simply a step-by-step -step recipe for carrying out a task, like rotating a photograph 90 degrees or sorting a column in Excel. And the vast majority of algorithms are innocuous. An automated decision system or an ADS currently has no standard definition, but can be thought of as a computer program that takes input about a situation and then produces either a result, a recommendation, or a prediction to assist, assist a human decision maker. These can be fully automated or they can remain partially automated. An ADS uses algorithms, both simple and, and potentially complex, to make or assist decisions about potentially sensitive topics, which is one of the reasons why the city's task force focused on ADS in particular. The term of art the city uses to refer to it, quote unquote, an ADS is an algorithmic tool. And the city considers the term ADS and algorithmic tool to be interchangeable. Artificial intelligence and ADS are distinct but related topics. An ADS may or may not use AI-based algorithms. And there are uses of AI that are unrelated to ADS. I will now very briefly explain what AI is and some considerations to keep in mind. Artificial intelligence is a different way of writing computer programs. And it's often used in programs involving prediction. In traditional programs, traditional computer programming, the author has to provide an explicit recipe for how to carry out the task. AI, on the other hand, is example driven. Sorted manually, I'm sorry, it's example driven. Instead of writing an explicit, explicit set of rules, data is collected, sorted manually, and then mathematical methods are used to train the computer so that it can figure out rules by itself. For example, email spam filters are a good example of what can be considered AI due to the way they function, even though they have no general quote unquote intelligence. It can be difficult to understand what an AI system ultimately is doing, even when it works well. This is not unlike how some cooks, some chefs might struggle to write down a precise recipe so that others can follow because these chefs have learned how to create their dish by trial and error and experience. AI systems have been in use in virtually every field and aspect of society for a while from consumer financial services to healthcare, to housing, to transportation and more. Regardless of type, all systems have some error rate, any system, whether machine or human, as they are approximate methods. This is not unlike the errors and assumptions that uh, people might make. So whether it's a machine or a person, uh, there are errors in systems. With technology, however, we need to apply different methods to identify and address these errors. In addressing problematic results for decisions where technology is used, it's extremely important to take into account the specific application of a technology. Technology itself is not inherently biased. However, the ways in which systems are used or how results are interpreted can produce biased outcomes. AI ethics is an emerging interdisciplinary field led by academics, practitioners, technologists, and other stakeholders become active in the last five years or so. The term AI ethics refers to the study of features in technology systems that affect societal values. Principles considered in the field of AI ethics are fairness and non-discrimination, accountability, transparency, privacy, and accuracy. In real world systems, these principles are often in tension with each other and the importance of the human input into technology becomes critical. For instance, it may be necessary to use sensitive demographic attributes, which makes the system, could make the system, less privacy preserving. But they might be necessary in order to make a system fairer, depending upon the human input of the amount and type of information used in the system, results may be more or less 
fair. The city is actively engaging with the AI ethics community to learn and gain feedback on how cities can benefit from this important area of work. The city recognizes that as technology tools are more widely used, there's growing role for local governments in working to ensure that city residents are able to safely access technology and continue to engage in education, employment, community, and other activities utilizing technology systems to produce equitable results. The federal government has begun to grapple with this issue. Some states have made progress, but cities are also recognizing the unique role that they can play in addressing the impacts of emerging technologies. In 2018, the mayor, along with the mayors of Barcelona and Amsterdam, UN Human Rights, UN Habitat, and others formed the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. This is a first ever alliance of local municipalities to advance the concept of digital rights, to protect and empower urban residents in their use of and exposure to digital technologies. The foundation of the approach is the development and concept of these digital rights principles, which assert protections related to cybersecurity and privacy, equity, choice, affordability, quality, accountability, and ethics and non-discrimination. The mayor's office of the CTO currently uses these principles to guide the city's policy, research, programming, and engagement on both core and emerging technologies. These principles are critical to supporting not only individuals, but also entrepreneurs and small businesses in navigating our increasingly digital society. The city's coalition for digital rights is working with interested local governments, academics, and other experts on an initiative to apply and operationalize digital rights related to specific city systems and programs. Thus far, the coalition is working with a dozen cities in North America and Europe to identify technology informed practices in relation to observing digital rights. This is one of the first multi-city efforts to operationalize digital rights at the local level. New York City is serving as an advisor and facilitator for the initiative and will be engaging with leading practitioners, academics and others on structuring this initiative in the coming months and working to make sure the outcomes of it benefit New York City. Additionally, in November 2019, Mayor de Blasio signed Executive Order 50, recognizing that government agencies should leverage current technologies that rely on employing algorithms to support agency decision making while ensuring fairness and responsible impacts for New Yorkers. This EO created a new position of Algorithms Management and Policy Officer which is a role currently filled by the director of the mayor's office of operations, Jeff Tomkitty Kassem. This officer is responsible for developing citywide policies to guide agencies in the fair, responsible and transparent use of algorithmic tools, including those using AI. The city has moved forward with this work, publishing introductory policies in September of 2020 that are publicly available and launching the city's first ever agency compliance reporting process. Agencies are currently reviewing their systems to identify those meeting the definition of an algorithmic tool and will report back on their findings. In January, 2021, the officer will publish a public report, including information from these agency reports. Through this exercise, the city will have its first ever look at the scope and scale of algorithmic tools in use by city agencies. This baseline understanding will further aid the officer in developing additional assessment and complaint resolution policies in 2021 and beyond, as required by EO 50. The role of local governments in balancing the benefits of technology use while protecting residents from unintended harms is only at its beginning stages. While the city has already demonstrated leadership among its US peers, this work will need to evolve along with the development of new technologies and new applications. The city looks forward to continuing collaborations, with leading thinkers, practitioners, other stakeholders, and the council, as it puts into practice principles, policies, and protections to enable all New Yorkers to safely and equitably benefit from current and emerging technologies. Finally, I will turn to intro 1894. This bill would regulate the use of automated employment decision tools used in the hiring process. The administration shares in the council's strong interest in rooting out bias in decision-making systems that use algorithms and artificial intelligence. We have operational, legal, and financial concerns with this bill as currently written, particularly in light of the various crises the city faces 
during the COVID-19 response and the current financial situation. And we look forward to working with the council to address these issues. Thank you for your time today and for your interest in this important topic. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. I will now turn it over to questions from the chair. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Holden, you might begin your questions. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. I just want to uh, recognize we've been joined by Council Members Lander, Ku, and Constantin Petey. Um, Mr. Farmer, can, can you elaborate a little bit on intro 1894? Some of your concerns were operational, legal, and, or financial concerns. Can you, can you kind of go over what's the problem with the operational or, I mean, in legal, we can kind of figure it, it might, might have some challenges, but can you elaborate on the financial concerns, especially? Thank you, Chair Holden, uh, for the opportunity to be here and for the question. Uh, yes, on 1894, uh, we are currently reviewing this. As you can understand, there are a number of parties in the administration that uh, need to be a part of these conversations. Um, as you see, you've got several here today that are especially relevant, but there are others on the legal and budget fronts uh, that have uh, an important role to play. And ultimately, we need to further discuss with them uh, how exactly we define uh, the concerns and, uh, and how we communicate them. Yeah, if anybody else, if the uh, deputy commissioner wants to say anything or anybody else in the administration wa wants to elaborate on that, some of their concerns. I mean, I'll just say first of all, hi, uh, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Chair Holden, for having me. And thank you, um, Ma Majority Leader Kuma, for also um, having me here today. Um, you know, our role within uh, the legislation is um, fairly limited, um, meaning that I think legislation notes that the commission, you know, may consider promulgating rules in this space. Um, but, you know, we, it was important to us to be here today to just, um, you know, share uh, one, our, you know, deep commitment to rooting out discrimination wherever it occurs, um, and two, um, our, you know, appreciation for, for this issue. Um, but I don't know that I have a, a ton beyond that to share in response to this question. But but you you do support the spirit of the bill. Uh, yeah. The details we can work out, right? Well, so I'd say, you know, obviously as the agency that's charged with, um, you know, enforcing and educating New Yorkers about their protections against discrimination, um, and also as an agency that's been kind of educating itself about these issues, um, you know, for some time now and had the honor of serving with, with Jeff, um, and others on the ADS task force. Um, these are issues that we, we care quite a bit about. So certainly happy to be engaging with the council around these questions. Uh, Director Jeff, do you wanna jump in on any yeah, of that? Yeah, I think I'll just add to, to what Brittany said, council member, and, and thank you all for having us here today. I think as we've kind of talked to you before, we know this is a pretty emerging area. And one of the big things that we were tasked at, um, with as both the task force and then now uh, with the AMPO is to, better understand uh, what systems do exist and how best to evaluate them. I think that many of the people who joined us on the task force kind of spoke very passionately about, you know, there aren't any concrete kind of processes or tools right now that you can uh, absolutely rely on. You have to evaluate them as well to figure out where um, they're most appropriate in trying to take a look at bias and other disproportionate impacts. You know, uh, the same tools you might use for hiring may be different that you would use for financial considerations. And that's certainly something that came out in the task force and something that I think is work that needs to happen, not just for the city government, but I think for the private sector. So um, just to add to what John Paul was saying earlier, I think that there are certainly concerns in trying to ramp that up and figuring out kind of how um, to really understand which are the best processes to use. There, there's so much evaluation that has to go on with that. And then from an enforcement standpoint, what that means. But maybe John Paul Farmer, would, wouldn't this, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just puzzled at the financial concerns because wouldn't this bill kind of add revenue um, to, the, to the city or, you know, uh, so why, why the financial concerns? Do, do we, can you elaborate on that? So I think the financial concerns that I can elaborate on are the ones that we're all very much aware of, just the general status uh, in the city, the challenges to, uh, to, to our budget right now. 
Uh, in terms of the specifics, I think we'd want to consult with our uh, colleagues who are focused on that professionally at OMB. Um, but the general, the general feedback is just that it's very hard time for us to build new mechanisms as opposed to using the mechanisms that are already in place. Uh, okay, thank you. This, this question could, and it's a general question again for anybody in the administration, what are the main ethical issues associated with uh, auto, automated decision systems or artificial inte intelligence? So what are, what are the, like that you, that comes to mind that you see right away or that you've uh, researched? And this could be for anybody on, in the administration. So I'm happy to, to start it off uh, and see what others have to add. Um, it goes back to some of the testimony that I gave and how we think about uh, digital rights and the way the city's coalition for digital rights, which has been a mechanism through which we've really been sharing and learning from uh, other cities that are grappling with the same challenges that we are. And so some of the things that have come up are cybersecurity and privacy, um, equity, choice, affordability, quality, accountability, ethics, and non-discrimination. Those are all principles that have been agreed on by a number of cities that are in similar seats as New York uh, about the things that we need to pay attention to as these technologies get used both uh, within government, but also out in uh, broader society. Anybody else? Uh, I mean, I, I think that there are clear, um, I think the majority leader combo kind of said it correctly. There are clearly concerns around systemic racism and kind of the history of how thing, decisions are being made. I think how that integrates into any um, system that helps on hiring or anything else is something that we all are um, pushing forward to. One, try to understand kind of the systems that are in place, understand good ways in which to evaluate them, and then figure out kind of a method and a process that we can really uh, make solid recommendations on how to counter for them because we don't also want to take away from some of the innovation and the potential positive impacts that could come from such tools when used correctly. Uh, don't want to you know, speak to the fact that they're all um, uh, tools that don't have a need for evaluation, but you know, the potential for the tools to help are strong ones. Yeah, and if I can add uh, to, what, to what Jeff just uh, said, the context matters so much. And that's why we're doing the work that we're doing uh, to understand how these tools are being used today, how they might be used in the future and in which context. So AI, for instance, that's used to optimize the battery life of your iPhone does not have nearly the consequential questions associated with it as something like employment or who gets a loan or uh, uh, ultimately what kinds of policing decisions are made. All of that is much more consequential than say your battery life uh, or how a data center gets managed by a large tech company. All of those are using AI today. And it's important that we recognize the innocuous uses, the beneficial uses, uh, and then that we create the appropriate protections to ensure that New Yorkers uh, have these, these digital rights that, uh, that I've referred to. Um, this might be the million dollar question, but often people who are impacted by the decisions made by automated decision systems don't even know that the decision was made by a machine. Uh, do you think that people should have the right to know that a decision impacting their life, their life, their property, their liberty was not made by a human being? I think there's a lot of benefit. One, a very good question. Thank you for offering that up. I think there's a lot of benefit to transparency and making sure that people understand uh, where technology is involved, uh, where human beings are involved. And I think that can be an important part of the process by which the city uh, gives people uh, a voice in how technology is used in society and in, in how they might lodge a complaint, uh, for example, with uh, CCHR or others. In addition to transparency, we also need accountability. We need to make sure that the people who are making the choices about what data goes into these systems, about how the system is designed and then ultimately how it gets deployed, uh, that, that those folks, wherever they might be, uh, are accountable for the choices they're making. Um, if you go back to a technology from over a century ago, automobiles. Automobiles were a new technology in society and people had to figure out what role they're gonna play, how to maximize the benefits and minimize harms. And if you look at cars today, um, at least how, how they have impact on people, if something goes wrong, generally there's an ability to hold accountable 
the person who made that car, if it was defective, some piece of it, uh, or the person who operated that car, if they did it in a uh, harmful and dangerous and negligent way. And so similarly, we're looking at new technologies, but a lot of those same questions remain about ensuring that we have appropriate kinds of accountability and that we have transparency so people, uh, as you rightly mentioned, can understand the role that these technologies are playing in society. Um, John Paul Farmer, th thanks for that, uh, that answer. But um, I just have a question on, um, that wasn't mentioned in your, your testimony. Who oversees ADS, the use of ADS by our, the city agencies? Um, does does, does uh, your office have the power to do this? The work across government is very much collaborative. Uh, so we each have roles to play and that's why each of us are, are here today. But uh, certainly Jeff in his role as the algorithm management and policy officer plays an absolutely critical role. And Jeff, I'll let you uh, uh, take the rest of the question. Yeah, um, Councilmember Holden, I think that for the AMPO, the role really is uh, much as defined with the council when we um, move forward with EO50 is to really figure out a way to empower and educate each of the different agencies. One, to evaluate internally and identify the systems that they are using that uh, use, um, that are automated decision tools um, to make them publicly aware, I mean, make the public aware that those tools and systems exist, and then to work with them, um, basically building up the capacity within each, within each of the agencies themselves, grounded by common city guidelines and processes to evaluate and you know those systems themselves because it would be false to think that any one person in the city should be in charge of evaluating all the cities so much as to really define the processes and the policies so they could do it themselves they will know the specific uses they will know the specific kind of uh trade-offs that they have to make uh and that's the role at least of the ampo um which is slightly a little different from some of the conversation here around uh any type of uh private uh, sector evaluation, but that is certainly what we are doing for the city agencies. So you are uh, in charge. You're the head of the algorithms management and policy. That's you are correct. you are the AMPO person. Are you permanent? Is is this a, are you acting or because we haven't heard much about it? Well, I. I'm sorry that you haven't heard much about it. We've been trying to uh, do a bit more. I'm I'm the interim. I'm I'm acting in that role. Um, we posted for the role, but obviously given what happened with the pandemic, there were uh, limitations to what we could do in that point. Um, it has been an extraordinary challenge to kind of continue to move this forward. Uh, there were certainly delays, don't want to kind of hide from that in the beginning, but we moved forward pretty quickly. We have posted uh, policies uh, onto our website that have been determined for the city agencies. We've engaged with each of the city agencies to start the work of evaluating what systems, and we've set our own deadlines to make sure that we will have our first um, uh, submissions from the agencies in December, and then we could then provide to the public and to you, to the council in January, uh, that first list. Um, and I think, you know, one of the big things that we all talked about in previous hearings was about public engagement, and while that has also been slowed down given where we are with the pandemic. We did hold our first uh, public event with Civic Hall in September, um, a good attendance, and we're planning for more after that uh, so that we can keep give, getting that uh, public engagement and their input. Um, uh, Director Jeff, can you uh, tell us, uh, you know, does the city of New York use automated decision systems or AI in hiring decisions? I can't speak directly right now. I know that, you know, obviously the city does use algorithmic decision tools. Um, and that's part of the reason why we move forward with our uh, task force and why um, EO50 was signed. But um, it is uh, early and I can't speak to each agency's use. That's actually what this current process is on so that the agencies can provide that information and we can publish that list. But we don't know, we don't have, we don't have the list yet. We, we'll, we don't we'll have perfect visibility, no. So what's our goal here to find out who's using it by when? We're by January, we'll have a initial list from the agencies on the different tools they're using. They're not necessarily just on hiring tools. It's um, automated decision tools that the uh, agencies are using. Well, let, let's say, let me just get, you know, when discrimination or uh, bias occurs, who in your opinion should be liable? Uh, the company, 
that made the decision, uh, you know, a company or a vendor who created the software? Uh, I, I certainly think it depends. I might um, turn it over to um, Deputy Commissioner Saunders to kind of help out in terms of what the avenues are to kind of register those concerns. But I certainly think that it isn't a one, you know, a single answer for that. Brittany, I hope you don't mind. No, 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 absolutely. Um, so I think one of the things that it makes sense for me to state here is that, you know, the city human rights law, which of course provides protection in employment as well as other areas um, of jurisdiction like housing and public accommodations, um, you know, uh, prohibits against discrimination in employment, right? And so that, that applies whether or not someone is sitting in front of a stack of paper resumes and going through them and extrapolating things about people's identities and then discriminating on that basis, or whether they're using some sort of um, uh, sophisticated algorithmic tool to, to screen applicants um, and then to decide who they're going to extend an offer um, to interview or an offer of employment to um, on that basis. So the city human rights law does provide some protection against discrimination in this space. Um, and if, you know, if those cases were to come before our law enforcement bureau, they would be um, investigated and um, hopefully resolved through negotiation or through litigation um, appropriately. So that is certainly one uh, mechanism that applies um, in, in this space and offers um, protection for folks who um, either suspect that they may have been discriminated against or for folks who see, you know, a certain um, service being used in a place of employment. Um, and, and yeah, so that is one of the existing mechanisms. I don't want to force this issue, um, Deputy Commissioner, but what, you know, what, what, what issues do you see that are related to the enforcement of 1894? Do you see any, any um, you know, issues? I know I asked kind of a, a similar question. I know you said you couldn't, but um, did you, did you, did you, did you look at that? Did you look at the bill and possible? I did. I did look at the bill. And I think, you know, specifically kind of starting with our part, you know, the thing that's specified about the city commission on human rights in the bill is that, um, you know, we may promulgate rules as necessary to, um, to kind of dig into or elaborate on um, what discrimination in this space looks like. And I think that's something that we are certainly um, excited to, to consider. Um, you know, and we've seen in other spaces that things like best practice documents or, you know, even simple FAQ documents or um, more formal legal enforcement guidance or even more formal rules can play a really important role by both um, educating folks about the protections that apply to them, but also educating folks about the, um, the obligations that apply to them. Um, I will say, though, kind of consistent with what um, John and Jeff both shared that, like, this is a really challenging time from a resource perspective. Um, for the agency, um, we've sustained, you know, uh, losses to both our personnel budget and in other places. And so it is, um, there's quite a lot of um, challenges that we're encountering in terms of trying to go above and beyond and doing more than what we are already doing in this space. So I will be honest, I think that is a challenge that we face and something that we have to juggle as we're thinking about um, what additional steps we can take um, in this space. Uh, thank you. But Intro 1894 suggests an annual bias audit. Uh, would your office be capable of conducting such an audit? Uh, so I think the way the bill is currently structured, that's um, it's an amendment to, I think, the unfair consumer practices section of the administrative code, which we don't um, administer. So I don't really have um, a ton of expertise in that space or about how those sorts of um, those sorts of practices are run. I will just say again that our resource situation is such that taking on a, like a new kind of affirmative um, uh, set of responsibilities like this is uh, really would be challenging um, for us. Um, but we are certainly, as I said, um, uh, more than happy and in fact excited to think through um, what rules or guidance or other policy documents in this space could look like. If I can, if I can add on to that, just specifically on the question of independent bias audits which are an interesting, interesting and potentially important and powerful uh, approach. It's still early and there's really no standard definition of exactly how those should work or what they should be. And so some of the work that we're doing right now through the city's coalition for digital rights uh, and the initiatives associated with that uh, could give us more clarity on that and give us more of an ability to understand what that should look like 
in the future. Uh, and if we were to be trying to implement something like that now, we have both the resourcing questions that Brittany brought up, but also the questions around uh, just a little bit of a lack of clarity and, and models haven't necessarily been proven out yet. And just to, to make sure everyone is on the same page here, this is gonna be very different from say a tax audit. It's gonna be a very different kind of process. And that's why the pro it's still working itself out. Um, I, I'd like to ask uh, Director Jeff this question. How many staff members work under AMPO? There, you know, as we've stood up, we have three lines plus the AMPO that are dedicated to this. Obviously, given where we are with the pandemic, um, not all of those are filled. At the same time, because we've had it currently in the Mayor's Office of Operations, I'm certainly using my own staff uh, to work on these things. So roughly about three or four. So, but, and they work under the mayor's office of operations. Uh, the, have, the current people, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're doing, they're doing like you, you're, you have multiple hats. They're doing, they have multiple hats too. That is correct, sir. Okay. Do you get uh, a separate annual budget? Or uh, no. Annual? You don't. We, okay. we, we have the lines, sorry, we have the budget are essentially the uh, budget for the lines that are allocated to the AMPO, including the APO themselves. All right. Uh, I'm going to turn it back uh, to the committee councils. For, so I, I see a lot of uh, questions. I don't want to monopolize this, but I see a lot of questions uh, hand raised from my colleagues. So I'm going to turn it back to the committee council to call on council members. Thank you, Chair Holden. I will now call on other council members to ask their questions in order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The surgeon at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the surgeon has announced that you might begin before delivering your questions. First, we'll hear from Councilmember Kuhn, followed by Councilmember Lander. Councilmember Kuhn? Starting time. I, I guess Councilmember Kuhn uh, stepped out, so we're going to Councilmember Holden. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Lander, I apologize. Starting time. Thank you very much uh, to the chairs for this hearing and to the administration for uh, attending. Um, uh, CTO Farmer, um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned in your testimony that the city has been sharing insights uh, from your AI work with some of the international partners uh, that you have. And I, I wonder if you could use this forum to share some of those insights with the council uh, and the public here. Certainly. So thank you for that question, uh, uh, council member. The insights have gone into creating the principles that I described earlier. So all of this, frankly, was started from scratch. Uh, it, it's an emerging field, one that individual cities were starting to think about. We came together to agree upon uh, these principles. Just this year, uh, some of these principles applied to things like um, exposure notification applications in the, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, that's a place where work has been done. Right now, a dozen cities across North America and uh, the United and, and uh, Europe are working on what each of them are going to be do to do to experiment uh, along these lines about city application of uh, artificial intelligence tools over the course of uh, 2021. So there's a lot on the horizon. The work that's been done has essentially produced what I've what I've shared so far. Uh, thank you. I, and I guess I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll combine that with my next question because maybe this is, I guess, I'm curious, you know, if there was sort of work product along the way, if, uh, you know, those insights were gleaned from data before they became the principles and, and if those were shared with partners, if we in the council might see it. And I mean, I guess maybe one place to do that would be in the report here 
um, as I understand it, that's due on December 1st as, uh, on the work the administration is doing here, and I wonder if we're on track to meet that deadline, um, what we can expect to see in it, um, and I guess if that date's not going to be met, um, given the dynamics of COVID and, and resources, when we could expect to see it. So I, I think that question, Jeff, was that for you about when the AMPA work is going to be coming? So um, I'm not sure if that's what you were referencing, council member, but I think that our uh, submissions are due from the agencies on uh, systems uh, that they've evaluated in December, but actually our public report is in January. I'm sorry, I, I really apologize. I was having a little trouble with my sound. Can you just see if I, that's on me, but can you say that again? I, I just said, I, I don't know actually if this is what you were referencing, but uh, for the AMPO at least, uh, we have admission, uh, submissions due from the city agencies in December, but actually our public report is not until January, and we are on track to that. Okay. Um, all right, but then I guess that sounds like that isn't quite the same thing, uh, CTO Farmer, as what you were talking about. So I just wonder, let me ask this, I'll ask the question separately, whether it's possible that some of the, you know, the work product, the material that you've been sharing in those international exchanges is material that could be made available to the council or to the public. Um, you know, I, I think this is, a, as you tried to demystify at the top of your, uh, you know, in your presentation to us, you know, this is something that it, 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 it provokes a lot of anxiety. It's not easy for people to understand what's going on. And I think the more transparent information we can provide and show, here's what we gathered, here's how we got to those principles, here's the steps we're taking, uh, could help a lot in helping us, you know, just have confidence in what, in what's taking place. That's helpful. Thank you for the clarification. So number one, yes, we're happy to share with you and the council um, uh, some of the documents and put that in order so that it makes a little more sense than it might have been just randomly thrown at you. In terms of public reporting, that's something that we are considering for 2021 and, uh, and hope to have uh, the, the ability to do. Can you just maybe say a word of what sort of public reporting you're considering? So that partially depends on the outcome of these dozen uh, initiatives at the local level around the world. Uh, we are we are trying to get some more clarity on uh, where the biggest challenges are and, and maybe where some things aren't as tricky as, as folks might currently think. So this is a, a broad set. The, the digital rights principles are very broad. So some focus on AI, some focus on uh, what happens when people can't be connected to broadband. Um, but ultimately, these are all related. And the role that technology plays in people's lives, I'm whether, it's, whether it's the harms from AI or whether it's the lack of broadband, uh, it, they're all related. And so, so that's what we're looking at and we're trying to do is gather the information essentially in the first quarter, perhaps first quarter, second quarter of 2021, so that we can then have a better understanding about what might be made public. Thank you. Welcome. And we'll follow up with... Uh, with some documentation so you can get a, a peek into what some of the work has produced so far. Oh, I apologize. Looks like I was muted. Uh, Majority Leader Combo, I see that you have questions. Starting time. You hear me? Hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit new to the AI world. And so my questions may seem a little um, naive or a bit not as informed perhaps as the other members on the committee. But this is an issue that I've taken up particularly because of the uh, racial and gender dynamics that we're talking about. So some of my questions are a little bit um, general. So the, f the first one I wanted to know, when did the city of New York begin to use AI in its hiring and, and recruitment practices? When did this begin? 
So I'm, I'm uh, one, thank you for the question. And thank you for the interest in this topic, because as I mentioned at the end of the testimony, it's a really important one. And it's, uh, it, it's one that we should all be paying attention to. So thank you for that. Um, I'm not aware uh, of whether the city is using AI specifically in, in hiring practices currently. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, is that something that in your, in yeah. your experience with interacting with agencies? I don't, I am not aware of it. I can't say for sure and I don't know because part of what we are looking at obviously is working with the agencies to identify systems that they may use. But um, majority there, we, we don't have that information and I, I don't think it's true, but I don't think we, we have, but I want to verify that. And one of the things that we're doing through the city's coalition for digital rights that I've mentioned, uh, Amsterdam and Helsinki, for example, are places where they're working on uh, registries so they can have a solid understanding of what's happening uh, where, and obviously that's work that, uh, that, that Jeff has been doing in his role as AMPO as well. And so connecting these best practices to make sure that we do have visibility. But as was mentioned, I'm not aware of any of those systems. Uh, Are we time. looking to do that? I have not been involved in any conversations uh, about using AI for hiring. Okay, that, that was really what I wanted to um, clarify and understand in that way. What at this at what this time? What capacity does the city have to conduct a bias audit, given the current financial crisis that we are facing? So I, I think uh, the question of auditing AI systems comes back to this: the, the fact that uh, interrogation of them can be tough because we don't have a specific step-by-step -step menu of every action that the system took. It's really based in many cases on the data that comes in and the data sets that are used. So that's one place to start is looking at the data that's used. Is that data lacking? Is that data in some way biased uh, toward one group or another? Um, so there are, there are pieces of this that we know, but pieces of it that are still being figured out. Uh, and this is a question, not just for New York city government, but for society, for the private sector, for governments around the world. And that's why we're trying to share best practices as much as possible. It's also why we're, we're leaning on the things that we know do work, the mechanisms that we have in place for, for example, reporting when somebody believes that they are a victim of, uh, of bias. And, and that's where, and Brittany's mentioned it, but I'm not sure, Brittany, if you have anything additional to add in your role as, as deputy director, or deputy commissioner of CCHR about uh, how CCHR thinks about the mechanisms that are in place uh, that are relevant here. Can you talk to me a little bit about, um, just because time is limited, I want to know through AI, as best as you understand it, is the bias that we're seeing, how, how does it, how is it created in a way you would think in the AI world, the bias of race and gender would be removed? How is race and gender still a part of even the technology and computer world, even though I recognize that a human yeah. is creating it um, from the research that I'm doing, it's, it is a human creating it, but then a human creates the AI intelligence that seems to create some other form of AI intelligence that creates another form of AI intelligence. What is it that applicants or individuals that are putting forward resumes and applications, what is it that the AI detects that then informs or eliminates people that are of a certain racial or gender mm -hmm. uh, denomination. How does that happen? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's unfortunately the legacy of what society has had in the past, what human beings have done, because human beings are at the root of this. They design the systems, they produce the data. Uh, they're the ones who are choosing how to apply this. And uh, the, these tools, especially when people don't understand how they work, can, can actually reinforce or even amplify that bias. And that's what we have to get uh, in front of and make sure it doesn't happen. That comes down to comes down to the data, comes down to which technologists are actually in the room creating these tools. Is that a diverse team or is it a team that is not diverse at all? Uh, and, uh, and then it comes about down to how we apply it, in which context we decide or a company decides uh, it is appropriate to deploy these tools. And, and all of those things have to be at, the, at the core. Okay. Um, if I could, just one more question. Um, what are your thoughts actually on this particular bill? Do you think that we have the ability to actually implement and enforce this bill? So I, I think as was mentioned earlier, we are very much aligned with the, the goal that we want to make sure there is not bias in hiring. We want to make sure the technology tools do not uh, create bias and frankly, do not perpetuate existing bias because 
we have to recognize that human systems are imperfect as well. So, uh, so we're very much aligned on the goals. Uh, I think that there are concerns on, uh, on resourcing right now and on ensuring that we have the ability to cover all of the current services that are being provided uh, and adding, even, uh, even if it's something that seems like um, we would be interested in exploring and experimenting with it, it's just tough in the current budget environment. So uh, when we say, or when the city says that something might not be right right now, that might really mean right now, and it could be something that in 12 or 18 months would make a lot of sense. In, it's hard for me to render a final verdict on, on this simply because we don't have all of the people who do have a say here on this call today. And, uh, and the reviews are ongoing in terms of the interagency conversations. How would you, just in closing, I imagine myself going on a job uh, interview or submitting my resume, not getting the job. How I really applaud anyone who brings these cases forward uh, to a legal place because obviously, when you're looking for a job, you are in a place where you don't necessarily have the time or the energy to bring a suit forward in that way. What were the circumstances or the situations that would allow someone to say, Hey, I think this software or this particular AI, or however it is, um, has prevented me from getting this particular job or profession. How, how does one come into a place where they have determined that they wanna bring this case forward? Do you have examples or how would someone make the decision? Because for me, I would just say, oh, I didn't get the job and think nothing more of it and apply someplace else. But when someone gets to that point of saying, you know, hey, this doesn't pass the smell test. What's going on here? How have those circumstances arisen? That's a that's a very good question. Uh, I think in some ways this ties back to something that Chair Holden brought up earlier about transparency. Should people know that these technologies are being used? Uh, and and if people do know, well, that answers uh, part of the question. It makes it certainly much easier for someone uh, to 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 have some basis upon which they might um, ask questions. I want to pass it over to Deputy Commissioner Saunders about uh, exactly how um, the CCHR process and the human rights law that's on the books would, would uh, interact with the question you're asking. I mean, I think it's a great point. And I think it really does tie back to that question of notice because you're right. I think it would be, I should also say upfront that I work in the policy department of the commission. I don't work in the law enforcement bureau and we do maintain um, you know, some separation um, for I think really important reasons. But I will say that like, I think you're absolutely right that there are many, um, cases in which people would not know um, what the you know, process that led to their not receiving a position would have been. And so I do think that point around notice is an incredibly important one. Um, and I think it's, it's an important one for us to consider moving forward. Okay, um, I'll turn it back over to my colleagues and hopefully they'll be around too. Thank you. Council members? Council? I, I don't see anyone else having questions. Council Member Holden, do you have any final questions? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I just want to say people do have the right to know um, what, uh, you know, what's, what uh, AI or uh, ADS is, is it being used in the hiring practice? They have the perfect right to know and the city should, you know, let us know right away. Yeah, because if this is going to go on and, and there's no way to, to track discrimination. So we must have this and this, is, this has to be done yesterday. So we shouldn't have to wait until we don't even know who's using it. That, you know, it's still, we don't even know who's using it. I don't think anybody knows who's using, what agencies are using. So we need to, to move fast on this. And this is not a budgetary problem. It's not. I don't want to hear, you know, again, we're hearing the administration use COVID a lot, but I don't want to hear that on this. Um, by the way, I just want to ask uh, the CTO, um, John Paul Farmer, I, you mentioned Bar the cities of Barcelona and, uh, and certainly you mentioned Amsterdam. I think you mentioned uh, in your testimony that, that they're using ADS and AI. Um, how did, do you know, can, can we find out how they provide oversight? Uh, can I ask you, Chair Holden, for, for uh, when you say oversight, do you mean with council? Do you mean within the agencies? Just generally, like we're we're talking about who you know who's controlling this. Uh, you know, th there's got to be some oversight 
um, on the use of ADS and, and AI uh, in hiring practices, let's say. Um, do, do, you, do, you, do you see, did you find any information on, on those cities on, on how they're conducting it? I've not gotten information specifically about hiring practices. It's, it's, uh, it's something that's been brought up as a, uh, a general topic uh, and people understand the, the importance of it. We're talking about access to opportunity here and how critical that is. Uh, I have not heard any of the cities that we are working with on this discuss examples locally uh, or certainly not within their own governments. And as we mentioned earlier, um, as uh, Director Tom Kittikasem and I mentioned, we're not aware of specific examples here in New York either. Um, the process is going on to, to learn more, uh, to learn more both about what, what's happening uh, across society, because I think it's more likely at this point, and this is um, just kind of a, I don't have hard data on this, but it seems more likely that uses uh, are happening in the private sector that uh, um, we would like to learn about uh, as opposed to in, in agencies. But either way, we wanna make sure we get a better understanding. That's what some of these registries that I mentioned are really about. It's getting a, a more of a baseline understanding uh, to ensure that we, we understand where we're starting from, where we're going. And then as new technologies get incorporated into uh, the, the day-to-day -day business, part of that being hiring, uh, that we ensure that there are, one, there's visibility on the part of city governments, we understand that, um, but also hopefully guidance and best practices that we can promulgate and that we can encourage people, uh, at least encourage people to, to do things according to best practices. And because this is such uh, an evolving, fast moving space, um, we could very well have much stronger and more solid best practices six or 12 months from now than we have today. Okay, so um, so we do have we do have the talent to do this uh, currently, right, Jeff? We have it with you, obviously. You wear well, many hats, but we yeah. can we can do this. I, I want to caution on one thing, particularly, just because I think that this is something that came up in our conversations with a lot of the panelists who are actually on this call, um, who are either advisor committee, we're on the task force. The idea of actually evaluating for bias is not a, a streamlined set thing. There isn't a common tool or process that everyone has agreed to. And even those things that people may use have, we've found, you know, kind of problems with. So it's not the, the lack of talent or the lack of commitment in trying to get this done. I just want to be very open about the fact that the idea of taking a look, particularly on the private sector, using so many different things, that's a lot. And there's not a lot of consistency yet on the right type of processes or tools that you would use to evaluate that bias. Does that make, I mean, I, I don't want yeah, no, to make the question. Sense. I wanted to be clear about it, that's all. It, it makes sense. And uh, obviously the private sector is one thing and we yeah. that is a little bit more complicated, but the city, I'm talking about the city hiring yeah. practices that you are using it. We need to yeah, if, a lot of transparency. Yeah, if they're using it, we're, we're going to identify and then we'll take a look at those. Yeah, especially if it's in the, the public, you know, city sector. That's different. All right. Um, I just want to, you know, John Paul, just uh, the last hearing, at our last hearing on October 30th of 2020, we asked you about the Moonshot Challenge that you organized on August 5th, 2019, uh, which my staff was honored to attend the award ceremony as a year ago. Uh, and again, the award was a nominal amount of $10,000 for the first three nominees. I mean, your office affirmed under oath that at that hearing that the award was paid. However, the winners in, just informed us that they have not yet received the money. Can you explain this discrepancy and can you enlighten us as to why the winners have not been paid? I'm sorry, Chair Holden, you're saying that today in fall of 2020, they have not received? They've still not been paid from last year. That is news to me, and uh, I'm aware that I'm aware that our office did everything that we believe needed to be done for that payment to occur. I will uh, take that as a to do today to go find out uh, why that's being uh, reported to your team. Yeah, because they they weren't getting a lot of money, and they did a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So oh, we think we think the um, it was a great event. 
right? The awards for open innovation challenges are, are important. Uh, they recognize uh, the, the work that people have put in and, and the benefit that people are creating in pushing the boundaries. So uh, we will absolutely look into that. I just want to ask uh, Irene Bahovsky, are there any other council members that have their hand raised? I don't, I don't see that. I do not see any other council members wishing to. The majority leader has her hand up on camera. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the old fashioned way. All right, let's <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead, majority leader. I'm trying my best. Sometimes oh, you have to go to the old school way. Right. Um, so do we have any idea at this point how much those type of um, audits would cost? And if the commission is not in a position to do it, who are we thinking which agency would be able to do it? In terms of cost, uh, I do not have specific numbers, but I, I can think of a couple of organizations that we could, um, uh, in the private sector, that we could reach out to to get uh, an idea of, of what, because this is the work that they do. To the point that was brought up earlier, there are not standards there, as I was pointed out, there may be some concerns with how different organizations are doing this. There's just not a single accepted approach. Um, in terms of internally, uh, I don't know if that's something that uh, Jeff or others have, have looked into. Are there ranking systems in terms of ranking AI systems that produce the most women candidates, that produce the most people of color, that have, I guess, beat the system or yeah. beat the machine? in terms of being able to say, you know, this particular system um, has gotten it right with a rating of X, Y, and Z, A, B, C, D, or something of that sort. Is there a way to, is there a formal way that on the back end side of this AI, we've been able to see who's getting a job, women, mm -hmm. men, people of color, LGBTQ, like however people are identifying, is there a way on the back end that we're able to see which AI technology is doing it the best? Uh, uh, we very much wish it were that easy. Um, uh, unfortunately, the challenge here is that because it's, it's not just the system itself, it's the system, the data inputs that go into it, as well as the context in which it's being deployed for what purpose, uh, it, it, it just isn't that direct. And so while you can measure and compare with certain data in a certain context, which set of algorithms, which AI system uh, is the most accurate, that could be something that you measure for, uh, but that might be different from which one is fastest or which one is, uh, what's another example, the most accountable, which one has the most transparency. And so you really have to choose which of the, um, uh, the levers or the aspects of this to, to optimize for and even then you're still looking at that in a very specific context. And so it's, it's at this point, not possible to simply look at all the options on the shelf and say, well, that one's the best all the time. Uh, we really do need to look at each one in context and, and with the data being a part of that. For me, who is still having trouble unmuting myself on Zoom, I feel that if I could think of that concept it should be easy to actually do in the sense of, of all the things that AI is able to evaluate and people are able to evaluate, it would seem that being able to evaluate who's actually getting hired would probably to me be the simplest of things that could come out of this. And probably it would seem that that should be the ideal goal that it was even created in terms of who can build the better mousetrap. Um, but I, I mean, I would imagine in this sense, it's probably because people don't want a better mousetrap and they want to continue to uphold uh, the same systems that have kept certain people out. They would want to continue doing that. But there should be a way for people to be able to understand which AI mousetrap has done it the best. And, and I would just respond that in a certain context, those kinds of comparisons um, are more possible, more doable. And a number of academics are working on this. Uh, folks right here in, in New York City, at New York, Cornell Tech, uh, elsewhere, 
uh, MIT, Stanford. There are a number of folks who are really diving into this. If we get, if we get really um, targeted and we can agree upon what we're trying to optimize for, and again, there might be trade-offs between privacy and fairness of a system. So if a system is protecting privacy as much as possible, it might be hard then to maximize the fairness of it. Uh, if you want to maximize the fairness, then there could be trade-offs. And so that's the kind of thing that a lot of folks in academia are studying right now or looking at. And, um, and one of the reasons that we expect to get a much deeper understanding in, uh, in, the, in 2021 and the years to come, that does not mean that we are not going to do anything until everything is figured out, uh, but it just recognizes um, the complexity of some of, these, of some of these issues. Okay, I just want to close with this. Um, in your capacity, you may have heard of my pay equity bill in terms of the fact that the pay equity bill will be looking within the city's hiring practices as far as, I'm, I'm using words that you might say like, that's not what it's doing, but to a layman, that's what it's doing. It's evaluating algorithms in terms of um, pay to understand if men, women, those with disabilities are getting paid more or less than others so that we can start to right those wrongs and root them out. But we capture that information in a way that's not personal um, so that it's not attached to a specific person. So I can't say that, hey, John's a council member and I'm a council member, but John's making more money than me. I have an issue with John. It's not that, it's more that we would be able to look at, if we're looking at the example of the council, which is not the right example, but if we're looking at the council, we're able to see that the men of the council are making more money than the women so that it's, so that it's more of a general thing and not a specific thing, which also protects the privacy. So it would seem like if we're able to find those, um, that type of information, that that type of information exists in a way that protects privacy, but also gives you the information that you need. I think that's a, that's an, a goal that absolutely we all share and we, and we are, would be happy to work toward that uh, if there are ways uh, to, uh, to address it. Um, in terms of the specific legislation, I think I'd have to take a, a look at it. Uh, the... The, I think you'll hear from others today about some of the complexity associated with these AI systems and, um, and why, just going back to a, a point of revisit, the context is so important because in some contexts, there is, is very little risk and a lot of benefit. In other contexts, more risk, but still a substantial amount of benefit and still in other contexts, but perhaps too much, uh, too much risk. And so that's why the context matters so much and so important that we have conversations like the one that we're having today uh, and that we make sure that every sector of society uh, has a part in this because ultimately this technology is affecting every sector of society and in the years to come is likely to, to do so even more. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Majority Leader. I, I have a couple of questions and then I think we can turn it over to the next panel, but um, I, wanted, I wanna just throw this to Deputy Commissioner Saunders. Um, you know, what role does the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, uh, formerly known as Consumer Affairs, play in the enforcement of this bill? Um, I mean, I think the bill is structured as an amendment to a portion of the administrative code that they administer. But beyond that, I don't know. I can't really speak uh, for them. Perhaps we'll get them on the next day. Uh, I have a number of things to talk to the commissioner about. Uh, and enforcement of, of COVID related things too with small businesses, but that's another subject. Um, uh, one more question. I don't wanna let Jeff, uh, the director Jeff uh, tee off uh, so easily. Um, and this, is a, is a, uh, this should be something I think that should be done, um, but um, we have such a great talent in technology in New York City, as you know. Uh, yeah. We have a lot of great companies and uh, not-for-profits even um, are we tapping into the not-for-profits uh, such as Beta NYC or, or Tech NYC for some, some ideas uh, or feedback on, on what could be done with this? Yeah, I mean, I think that we're trying to be pretty broad in who we reach out to. Um, we've, one, uh, got an advisory committee that we're forming, um, several with um, uh, from the council kind of appointing people, and we are nominating people. We've continued to move forward with public engagement um, uh, panels and, and functions so we can get that information. And 
obviously, you know, a lot of the people who are working on this, we informally talk all the time, trying to get as much information as we can to kind of move this forward. And then further, I know we work with EDC and several of the organizations as well to kind of reach out to other private and nonprofit organizations to get ideas around this, sometimes very narrowly and sometimes very broadly. Um, uh, and I know that, you know, I, I know you don't like the excuse and it's not trying to be an excuse, but obviously COVID has had to kind of rearrange how we reach out to some of the people and then kind of what functions we have. But, um, you know, you know, you have my commitment that we're going to continue to, to push on those public engagements. Well, let, let's do some kind of Zoom call with some of these not-for-profits uh, as just as a round table on, you know, sure. again, on Zoom and COVID should yeah. affect this. That's we're right. We're doing this hearing without contact. So we can do the same thing to, as sure. a fact-finding mission. Maybe we could send uh, Jean-Paul Farmer to Europe to discuss uh, yeah. with Barcelona and Amsterdam on a fact-finding mission, or maybe you can go, but we need, we need some information. Uh, and we need some best practices, obviously. But thank you all for your uh, wonderful testimony. And um, I just hope that the administration or some people can stay. I know you're busy, but can stay and listen to the public testimony um, because they might have, again, some great ideas and we, we should listen to them. But uh, thank you all. And um, I want to turn it over to Irene for the next panel. But thank you all again. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you, council members, every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I will be calling groups of panelists. Once your name is called to testify, our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arms will set the timer and announce that you might begin. We ask each panelist to limit testimony to three minutes. Council members will have an opportunity to ask questions after each panel of witnesses. I would like now to welcome our first panelist to testify, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Ms. Brewer, Honorable Brewer, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Manhattan Borough President. Borough President, we can't hear you. Still can't, the mic is not uh, operational. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank okay, you. sorry, I'm sorry about that. So I'm Gail yeah, Brewer, yeah. Manhattan Borough President, and I want to thank uh, Majority Leader Combo, and I want to thank you, Chair Holden, certainly mentioning Beta NYC makes me happy. So I appreciate the nonprofit focus, as, as always. And I want to thank the Technology Committee. I don't think I need to tell you that with 14, 14% unemployment and many lost jobs. This is an important issue in terms of people's future. Uh, the use of automated employment decision tools has accelerated this during this pandemic. I think AI systems are now used widely, as you know, to help companies evaluate candidates remotely, whether we like it or not. Um, it's basic tasks from helping to schedule interviews to evaluating interview answers and I think people may not know that they are in digital hands, as you said earlier. So uh, into 1894, it's a start, but it definitely needs changes. Transparency you talked about, I've been listening intently to your wonderful discussion with the city officials and oversight to prevent biases in hiring are essential, as you have stated. I think the council should require businesses creating automated employment decision tools to report the results of independent audits to obviously the Commission on Human Rights, as you know, but I also think in addition to CHR compiling them, they should be published in the city's open data portal. You know how strongly I feel about that particular entity. 1894 penalizes those who fail to comply with the audit and there need to be penalties for those who do that. Perhaps a ban on the sale of technologies, that those that failed their audit or some kind of fines, that would be up to you. Violations should be recorded and again, published on the open data portal. Um, I also think that 1894 will not prevent the use of technologies, including psychological and personality assessments. That's an issue. And I think you know that a group of civil rights individuals and organizations sent a letter to the council uh, talking about that. 
and making sure that any software system or process that aims to automate or replace human decision making uh, systems relevant to employment needs to have these tools. And I think you're very aware of that. So I hope that this language that they have suggested is in the bill. I know this bill establishes certain rights, but I do think it has to have a private right of action. And this is always controversial with the city law department, I know, but for those who are subjected to discriminatory biases by automated decision employment tools, I think they should have uh, know that they have legal recourses to challenge hiring decisions under this legislation. Otherwise, they'll just pay the fines and go by. So I think 1894 has the potential to establish fair hiring practices across the city, but we have to provide these protections. The economy is looking to rebound and everyone's looking for a job. Automated decision system biases have an unfair impact on many of our communities in general. And this legislation could be a step in ensuring fair practices and a diverse workforce, but it sure needs to have all the suggestions that you made earlier. And thank you for this really important hearing with a 14, 15%, maybe more unemployment. It's really uh, important to have this kind of discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Borough President. And thanks you for your work on uh, in technology, obviously for many, many years. And of course, transparency. And we thank you for all your, your hard work. Thank you. Uh, uh, any, any questions uh, for, the, for the borough president? I do not see any questions. Okay. And because we do not have any more questions, I would like to thank you, Manhattan borough president, for your testimony. And now uh, we, I will be calling our next panel to testify. And our next panel will be Athena Karp, Frida Pauli, and Roman Chaudhary. Ms. Athena Pauli, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. And you might begin when you're ready. Thank you so much Story for having time. me. Thank you so much for having me. Hope you can hear me. My name is Athena Karp. Um, I am a New York City-based and headquartered small business owner, as well as a certified women's business enterprise. I started my technology company, Hired Score, nine years ago to fight the inequality and inefficiencies of how candidates are treated, and on the other side, to help employers address these challenges. My team and I have spent the past decade addressing the problems that job seekers too often face and that employers deeply want to solve. If you ask yourself these short questions, have you ever applied to a job and heard nothing back? Have you seen coworkers get tapped for promotions when you were qualified but never considered? And have you ever looked at your office and team and felt it could and should be more diverse and inclusive? Like, if like most New Yorkers, you answered yes, the good news is that every employer we work with also worries about how to solve these problems. They care about treating candidates with respect, if nothing else, because it impacts their businesses if candidates have a bad experience. They want to make sure candidates hear back in a reasonable time, even when the answer is no. They want promotions to be fair, if nothing else, because employee satisfaction depends on it. And they want to make workforces more diverse and inclusive. Before technology tools existed, employers only had humans to review an increasingly large volume of candidates. We've heard about that today. With COVID, this has just accelerated further. More than 100% increase in surge in volume is what we've seen, and less and less jobs open to fill that. On average, our clients get over 100 candidates for every job, and humans are limited to even review half of the people who apply, with 98% of them end up being rejected. When only a human reviews a resume, unfortunately, humans can't unsee the things that often lead to unconscious biases that so many of us are striving to root out. That a candidate went to the alma mater and same school they did, that they grew up in their community, that this person worked at the same company as them. However, with technologies that are properly and carefully designed and tested, employers can ensure that these often conscious and unconscious biases are ignored by design. They are excluded, they are auditable, and they only job related criteria is considered for every person and every person who applies is considered fairly. I have seen job seekers and employers in New York dream of a better, more fair and efficient future. This is where technology, especially those that make clear, explainable and fair decisions, which is possible, can have a positive impact. Today, I'm grateful to speak to this committee about my support for this legislation, especially since my company could be subject to this proposed legislation. 
as this hearing has made clear, opaque and biased hiring tools can have real negative consequences on the lives of New York workers and workforce diversities. If improperly designed, automated employment decision tools could create challenges for the employers seeking to increase workforce diversity and seeking to comply Time with expired. discrimination laws. Um, the reason I support this legislation is simple. If technologies are used in hiring, the makers of technology and candidates can and should know how they're being evaluated. They should know and know that their consent was being given. Providers should be able to show that they only use job-related qualifications when considering people. And employers should deserve better information about the implications of the systems they use, as well as ability to differentiate between tested and untested, explainable and unexplainable solutions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Ms. Karp. I will be calling on Ms. Polly to testify. Ms. Polly, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. My, My name is Dr. Frida Polly, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pymetrix. Uh, so I spent 10 years in academia before starting Pymetrix as a neuroscientist at Harvard and MIT. Pymetrix is a vendor of employment selection technology, meaning we would be directly regulated by this legislation's passing. While tech companies are often known to oppose reg reg regulation, that is not the perspective I have. I think the public has lost trust in technology and as technologists, we must focus on transparency as a way to regain trust. This bill is about transparency and accountability and as such, I support it. As someone who's been building and selling hiring tools for the past several years, in my opinion, there's no reason why clear information about the bias in a hiring tool should not be part of this equation. Luckily, with hiring tools, there is a clear definition of bias put forth by federal law called adverse impact, and we recommend making this bill conform to that. Over the past several months, many employers have made commitments to improving workforce diversity. At the same time, many of these same employers may use HR tools that screen out disproportionate numbers of minorities in hiring. Up to 60% of companies use dated cognitive tests, which show consistent adverse impact and can lead to white candidates being selected at three times the rate of minority candidates. This bill is a crucial step to overcoming this disconnect with transparent information about the fairness of all hiring tools, not just AI, well-intended employers can be empowered to implement diversity-friendly systems. In addition, I strongly support this legislature as someone who believes technology can be a force for good. As an academic neuroscientist, I've spent 10 years studying the brain. And if we're trying to change the minds of people, that's not going to solve diversity. 30 years of research on unconscious bias shows that changing the name on the exact same resume from John to Jamal means that for every 10 interviews John gets, Jamal gets seven. We have tried unconscious bias training. It doesn't work. We have to start changing systems, including hiring systems, not human minds, in order to fix diversity. And algorithms can be intentionally designed to mitigate bias in a way that human minds cannot. And with the audits proposed in this bill, we can ensure that algorithms are held to these hired standards. Implementation is critical. As we've heard from John Paul Farmer, many prominent voices, including some on this call, have produced government governance frameworks for ethical AI. However, I want to strongly remind the committee that the scope of this bill is not limited to AI systems. Therefore, the structure of the bias audits must be relevant for all industry players. Further, if the goal of bias audits is to understand how a hiring tool will affect real New Yorkers, which I think is what Lori is saying, the focus of these audits should be on outcomes first and foremost, rather than being concerned with the inner workings, which is a lot of what we've heard about today. The focus on outcomes conforms with the federal law, which looks at adverse impact. So there is a solution here that's simple and easy. Only a focus on these outcomes will allow us to understand if they have biased results. Finally, I have come to believe that many employers in New York are sincere in wanting to improve the diversity of their workforce, and they are looking for solutions to help them. Nevertheless, in order for this legislation to be effective, bias audits must straddle a delicate balance between providing transparent information and not being so arduous as to discourage their implementation. We propose self-funded audits by companies, the results of which report to employers and the HRC, so it will not cost the HRC or the city anything. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Polly, for your testimony. I will be calling on Ruman Chaudhary to uh, testify. Just, uh, one second. Um, I, I think Majority Leader has a question for the panel. Thank you, Dr. Polly. Can you explain to me a bit just how you, can you explain to me just a bit in terms of what happens when the resume changes from John to Jamal? What is it about AI? Was it 
programmed to oh, so the the john and jamal lori was the human so it's the human just like you've said that looks at the resume and because the name is jamal not john john gets 10 interviews and jamal only gets seven and that is unconscious bias that is unremovable from the human brain as we have seen from decades worth of unconscious bias training it has nothing to do with ai i'm talking about the human condition that is impossible to remove unconscious bias from the human brain so, but ai and but ai can mitigate that because we would not i mean for example pymetrics and higher score as well don't even look at someone's name in the um in the process of building the algorithms or race or ethnicity or gender we're basically blind we're blind to your characteristics. We don't know if you're female. We don't know what your socioeconomic status is. We don't know what color skin you have. That's the beauty of an algorithmic system. Now that's the promise of the algorithmic system. However, as many on this call here will tell you, there are such things as proxy variables, meaning if I'm a woman, I play softball, not, bas not baseball. And that's how Amazon got into trouble. So we have to make sure that these algorithms, while they promise to be unbiased, are actually unbiased. And that's what these aud bias audits that you are suggesting are so important. Does that make sense? And sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that, I mean, I guess that makes sense. But like in the case of Amazon, like you said, yep. I mean, I just feel like I'm so naive. I don't even want to No, you're, you're absolutely not naive. My husband who like thinks he knows a lot about technology uh, asked the same question. So I think it's very normal to have these types of questions. The reason that the Amazon situation happened is because no one was pre-auditing their technology. So we pre-audit, hired score pre-audits, other systems pre-audit, meaning we test to make sure that everyone is being treated fairly. Um, that is something that we would we are proposing as part of this legislation is that these results of these pre-audits be um, be put forth and made public, and that way we could actually see an Amazon disaster before it happens and prevent it. Does that make sense? Yes, but okay, here's my million dollar sure. question and then I'm gonna get out of this. Not at all. These are like <laughs> really important questions. So um, would you oh. find that in your experience in today's job market that companies, you alluded to it, but is it that companies want to create the dynamics for a diverse workforce yes. or are there, or do you find that there are companies that still want to maintain, let's just say, a more whiter, more male workforce and purposefully create AI dynamics that are going to maintain the whiter, more male work environment. Because the Jamal and James thing is something that it would, it would appear that if you're creating these algorithms or this intelligence, that you would easily be able to, on the front end, address that. All those different sorts of things, like how you're saying, take the gender out of it, but then you're saying the softball thing. Like, it's all these different things that it would seem people could fix. They, they can. And that's, I think, exactly the point of this legislation, is that you actually absolutely can. And whether all companies want to do that, Lori, that's beyond my knowing. I think many do, and those are the ones we work with, and I'm sure there are ones that don't, just to be totally honest. Um, but I think there's an increasing number of companies that really genuinely want to fix this problem. It's a very hard problem to solve. As John Paul Farmer and others on this call have mentioned, it's not easy. That's why we have entire technology teams working on this. And as a former academic, you know, the minds working on this in industry are just as strong as the ones in academia. So we've got some good minds on it. Um, that having been said, it does require, the reason we think bias audits are critical is because it will enforce comply like people will then be forced to sh it's like sunlight is the best disinfectant if you're saying you're bias mitigated or bias free but no one is ever holding you accountable you're not going to push yourself to do your best work and to really look at all the forms of bias because you can just hide behind oh it's a proprietary technology and it's bias mitigated and just trust me we shouldn't re be required to just trust technology companies anymore they should be held to greater transparency standards and that's why this bill is so important is because we're we're suggesting that there be pre-testing done which we do which hired score does which other companies do so that even before you let an algorithm loose in the wild you know the impact it's going to have and that's what's critical and final question promise um as john paul uh we Probably spoke sorry. about this earlier in terms of the final outcomes how far away do you think it is for us to be able to see 
which programs are being able to tell us what's working, who's being hired, who's able to have the most diverse workforce as a right. result of the AI intelligence that they're utilizing. Because if we don't have, if we don't have that measure in place, mm -hmm. in my unexperienced in this world, then what are we doing? What, right. what, what, why is this AI even in place if we yep. have no measurable to even yep. determine if it's working, not working, racist, yep. not racist, who's getting right. hired, who's not getting hired. We've just right. created so, something that's doing something with no accountability. Yep, so just to concur with everyone on this call, AI and, and non-AI systems you know, have a lot of factors that they're considering. So we cannot say what is the end result on hiring because while my solution might be used at that very early stage to include a lot of people that might otherwise have been shut out as Athena mentioned, there's then the interview and then there's the second round interview, like, you know what I mean? So then other factors come into place. So we can't look at the end and say, oh, like what was the impact of the AI? We have to look at the impact at that very stage that it was implemented. And by the way, this is what federal law does. So we're not recommending anything that doesn't conform with federal law. Um, so all I'm trying to say is that I think it's absolutely critical to start shedding light on the important pieces of hiring because hiring consists of three or four different pieces and the more transparency we can shed on each one of those pieces and this bill could shed a very important part light on one piece of it, maybe multiple, you, we, I think we can get to uh, a situation where what you're asking for, um, happens. It's not going to happen overnight. This bill isn't a magic solution that's going to mm -hmm. fix everything. It's a, we think, a very important step in the right direction. And I would, we would say that it's no time to wait because as this pandemic ravages communities of color um, and women, it's now more important than ever, I think, to start putting some of these practices in place. So. Thank you. So thank you, thank doctor. You. I just have a one, I have a one question uh, yeah. on, on assessing the outcomes. Yep. And, um, like, you know, do you see a day when, and just to, to piggyback on the majority leader combos, uh, some question, yep. the questioning, um, do you think someday that we'll get like pharmaceuticals, like some kind of uh, stamp of approval, five-star rating, you know, uh, yep. software that we can rely on? Do you think we're, we're not there so, yet? Obviously we got a long way to go. I, if you want my honest opinion, if we could wave a magic wand and make the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission act like the Federal Drug Administration, um, where basically you have to submit tremendous amount of information and then get pre-approval for a tool, I think that would be what I would ask for, because I think that's essentially what we're doing, but all once a tool has already been released, which is suboptimal, but that's not what happens. So yes, I absolutely think, and maybe with this you no know, new administration that's coming in, they'll take this as a cause. But I think absolutely weighing the costs, which would be bias and adverse impact with the benefit, which would be the you know other aspects of the tool is the, and doing it before the tool ever goes live, I think would be a fantastic solution. We're not remotely there yet. And I'm sure many people on this Zoom have fantastic ideas as well on how we would do it. But yes, absolutely. I think that there needs to be um, more information that's shared about a lot of these tools um, and potentially in a different format. So. Thank you for Thank asking, you, Doctor. Thanks for the wonderful yep. testimony. Absolutely. Uh, and again, we may have to talk uh, later about this, but or maybe you can talk to the committee uh, council, and we can, sure. you know, we can you know, put our heads together on this. But we do need some discussion. Happy and to. We need to be working towards some of yep. the, you know, the goals that you mentioned. But thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Yep. Thanks so much. All right. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Polly. I will be calling our next panelist to testify, and then we open for questions for the panel. Our next panelist is Ruman Chaudhary. And before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Thank you. My name is Dr. Ruman Chaudhary. And I'm Party time. CEO and founder of Parity, an enterprise ethical AI audit company. As a leader in the applied responsible AI community, both as founder of Parity and formally as Accenture's global lead for responsible AI, I applaud the city's foresight in proactively addressing the harms that can be introduced by automated decision-making systems and in particular employment algorithms. In this testimony, I address three critical components of this bill's success. First, constructing an actionable audit. Second, instituting methods of citizen redress and highlighting harms. And third, providing a pathway for companies subject to this audit to share their process output without revealing intellectual property or exposing their data. These parts are necessary to create a successful, 
cyclical, self-reinforcing, and evolving audit methodology. First, introducing mandatory audits of HR algorithms is a necessary first step in ensuring responsible use of these systems. However, the current state of practice in our industry, as many have mentioned on this call, is that no clear standards or universally accepted guidelines exist to perform model audits. To date, audits range from purely qualitative assessments that result in lengthy documentation to purely technical platform-based implementations that assess only the technology and its outcomes. Both are insufficient. The former ignores the reality of addressing limitations within the technology, often resulting in wishful thinking that's simply not measurable or implementable, and the latter ignores the contextual applications of technology and how it interacts with human, society, and organizational structure. My first suggestion to the Council is to create a group to generate audit guidelines in collaboration with the multiple bodies that already exist to create responsible AI solutions. Organizations like New York University's Alliance for Public Interest Technology and the Algorithmic Advisory Alliance, of which I am a founding member. In my experience, groups like this are the most successful when they incorporate companies, civic organizations, policymakers, and technologists. Um, in this uh, audit output needs to be understandable by both technical and non-technical audiences and made avail available to the public. Implementation requires education. If audit is enacted, the city has an obligation to ensure employees are able to utilize output appropriately and properly. My second suggestion to the council is to introduce methods for individual citizens to highlight harms. While transparency is laudable, it ignores the power dynamic that exists between employers and employees as the majority leader has raised. Notification of algorithmic usage without a clear method to redress will not be beneficial and will likely raise more questions than it will answer. Finally, my third suggestion is to create a working environment for companies who would be subject to these audit methodologies to safely and securely share their intellectual property and data with audit developers. Similar regulatory sandboxes have been utilized successfully to create policy for financial regulation and data privacy. Collaborative creation allows for realistic solutions, testing, and iteration. Beyond these three stru structural suggestions- I'm expired to the city is to align with local, national, and international best practices and policies currently in development. Our collective goal is noble, institute forward-thinking policies to ensure all constituents reap the benefits of algorithmic decision-making systems, use and employment decisioning while mitigating and addressing harm. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And now I will turn over to the chair for questions. Uh, no questions. So. I don't see any more questions from other council members. I want to thank uh, the panel for your testimony. And now uh, I'm going to call our next panel. And our next panel will be Julia Stojanovic, Mark McCarthy, and Donald Tomaskovic Devey, and Stephen Kuyan. Professor Stojanovic, before you, you start, please say your, say your name and affiliation for the record. Starting time. Dear Chair Holden and members of the committee, my name is Julia Stojanovic. I hold a PhD in computer science from Columbia University. I'm an assistant professor of computer science and engineering and of data science at New York University. And I am the founding director of the Center for Responsible AI at NYU together with Stephen Kuyan, who will speak after me. In my research, teaching, and public engagement, I focus on incorporating legal requirements and ethical norms into data-driven algorithmic decision-making, and have in particular been focusing on the hiring domain. I teach responsible data science at NYU, and I'm delighted to see several of my students and of my academic colleagues here today. Most importantly, I am a proud and devoted New Yorker. I would like to applaud the Committee on Technology for their sustained efforts to regulate the use of automated decision systems, ADS, in New York City. The bill we are discussing today represents a potentially transformative opportunity to make the use of ADS in a crucial domain, hiring and employment, responsive to the needs of all New Yorkers. I'm speaking here in strong support of the bill. And I will say directly, based on the conversation on the first panel today, that the academic community and the Center for Responsible AI in particular are at the city's disposal 
to make the auditing and public disclosure requirements of the proposed bill actionable. The bill cannot be more timely. The COVID-19 pandemic is hitting members of minority and historically disadvantaged groups particularly hard with many losing their jobs and being unable to enter the workforce. If this bill passes, it will benefit job seekers by ensuring that the unaccountable use of algorithmic decision-making and hiring does not further exacerbate these inequities. And folks have mentioned inequities with respect to gender and race, but I also want to underscore that individuals with disabilities are suffering disproportionately from these systems. The bill will also benefit vendors of hiring ADS by helping create an economically and ethically sustainable ecosystem of technological innovation. Finally, it will benefit employers who use these tools by helping them evaluate the claims made by vendors during procurement with the help of auditing and by helping them build trust of job seekers and employees. And this will be done through public disclosure. In my statement today, I would like to make three recommendations. First, with respect to auditing. The scope of auditing for bias should be expanded beyond disparate impact to include other dimensions of discrimination and also contain information about the tool's effectiveness. Does the tool actually work? Audits should be based on a set of uniform, publicly available criteria, and they should be conducted by a third party entity with appropriate technical and domain expertise. My second recommendation is about disclosure. Information about job qualifications or characteristics for which the tool was used to screen should be disclosed to a job, job seeker in a manner that is comprehensible and actionable. Finally, my recommendation is to help create an informed public. To be truly effective, this law requires an informed public. I recommend that New York City invests resources into informing members of the public about data, algorithms, and automated decision-making using hiring ideas as a concrete and important example. I'm happy to explain my recommendations during Q&A. Thank you, Professor Stajanovich for your testimony. And our next panelist is Professor McCarthy. Professor McCarthy, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Thank you very much. My name is Martin. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the in Institute for Technology, Law and Policy at Georgetown and I teach in Georgetown's graduate program in communications, culture and technology. Uh, I'm also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute's uh, Center for Technology Innovation. I hold a PhD in, in philosophy. I strongly support this legislation. Uh, it, would, uh, it would serve the cause of, of workplace diversity and the protection of vulnerable groups in the employment process. Um, automated decision tools really have the pro promise of reducing bias that's introduced uh, by uh, subjective employer decisions. But if it's not properly designed, uh, these tools may instead reinforce and even worsen uh, existing patterns of employment discrimination. The intent of the bill is to disclose the extent to which one of these new tools might worsen workplace diversity. Uh, employers can't manage what they don't measure they need to know whether their prospective employment tools are likely to have discriminatory effects. And the only way they can know that is if the vendors conduct disparate impact assessments and convey the results to their potential uh, purchasers. To ensure that this intent is carried out, uh, I recommend uh, that the bill be clarified so that the required bias audit must assess the tool's potential adverse impact on protected classes, and this assessment should be disclosed to potential purchasers. Now, there are many different ways of assessing bias in an audit, uh, but uh, what my recommendation is, is that the, the, uh, the bill should require at least a disparate impact assessment. The standard measure of adverse impact in employment law is well understood. It's whether a policy, procedure, or tool returns positive results for members of a disadvantaged group in the same proportion as for other groups. If the tool preserves statistical parity in this way, it will not worsen outcomes for protected classes. Vendors can test whether their automated tools are likely to have an adverse impact on protected classes by conducting their initial assessments on different demographic groups and measuring what proportion of people in protected classes receive positive results. 
uh, Chair Holden, you mentioned in your opening statement about Amazon, and that's exactly what Amazon did and why after it found it, it had a disparate impact. It did not put its employment tool into practice. Of course, vendors whose employment tools do have an adverse impact on protected classes should be allowed to explain that their bias uh, in their bias audits that their tools have uh, relevance to job related characteristics and are consistent with the compelling business necessity. And this would allow employers to compare employment decision tools to show for an alternative that satisfies their business needs with the smallest possible uh, discriminatory effect. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. And our next panelist is Professor Tomaskovich Devey. Professor Tomaskovich Devey, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Starting time. I think you're still on mute. Just give us a moment. Can we unmute the professor? Here we go. Okay. Great. Sergeant Leonardo, sorry Starting about time. that. I apologize for that. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Donald Tomaskovic Devi. I'm the director of the Center for Employment Equity at the University of Massachusetts. Our center um, is uh, concerned with promoting equitable workplaces um, and, and using scientific um, research to figure out what works and what doesn't. My test today, testimony today is supportive of the bias audit bill, and I'm uh, proud of New York City for um, considering it. The best organizational research shows that the most effective approach to promoting equal opportunity employment decisions is to develop appropriate goals and metrics, share them with stakeholders and embrace accountability for outcomes. When thinking about hiring technologies, this implies both demonstrating their connection to the actual work being performed and ensuring that the results of their recommendations are not biased for or against particular demographic groups. It also requires transparency to users, both the job seekers and the employers as to the results of these bias audits so that they understand the potential for bias and can choose technologies that minimize or preferably eradicate bias in their recommendations. Prior studies of diversity policy efficacy have found that accountability structures lead to clear improvements in the representation of women and minorities. Um, if no one is accountable, change is unlikely. And transparency can serve as a powerful foundation for accountability, empowering decision makers and employees alike. So that both the transparency and accountability aspects of this audit tool are important. When organizations make their employment processes transparent, managers and job applicants better understand how decisions happen. In this case, it's essential that the purchasers of hiring tools and technologies understand how the selection devices work, that they have an opportunity to look under the hood as needed, to understand the potential sources of bias with regard to race or gender, and most importantly, that they are armed with clear, solid metrics associated with both expected and actual performance on different demographic groups. Race and gender bias can also arise based on its association with proxy variables such as social class, for example, if the employee screening technology is based on a firm's current workforce, and that firm has tended to hire from Ivy League schools rather than CUNY or my alma mater, Fordham, an unsupervised algorithm will tend to neglect the good New York candidates. We don't want that. This result is, however, not inevitable, as hiring technologies can be designed to discover this type of bias and root it out. Um, Without that proper transparency and auditing, however, it's hard to know if this is happening um, and it's even hard to get the firms to do it. Um, at this point, it's clear that uh, many in the AI machine learning community recognize these biases are there in the design and data and algorithmic decision-making, but it's also clear that these can be I'm audited and, bi and bias removed. Um, it's not really a difficult technical problem. Um, 
Um, uh, there are firms that do this already. Um, I want to um, conclude with a couple of uh, points. The first is automated employment selection tools can give the misleading sense to managers that there's no bias in their decision making because they don't feel like they're making the decisions anymore. This idea of fairness by blindness um, can give a false sense of security that can lead a man managers to assume rather than promote bias-free workplaces. Um, finally, I support this bill um, because it introduces clear metrics and transparency and empowers decision makers to reduce bias in their employment decisions. I also think it's clear that this industry um, has already demonstrated it's unlikely to police itself, but some firms like Pymetrics um, already do. Um, so this is possible. It's technologically feasible now. Thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Professor. I will not now turn over to Chair for questions. Uh, yes, uh, th this is a great panel again. We have some experts uh, with wonderful testimony. Let me just ask a, a question. Uh, should the disclosure requirements be applicable to other automated decision systems other than hiring related systems? Uh, I'll ask the entire panel, anybody wants to jump in. If we can unmute them. Yes, we, Julia. Professor. Uh, it's Mark um, McCarthy. Um, I, I, I'm happy to to suggest that the kind of disparate impact assessment that uh, I think the, the bill implicitly calls for and should be clarified to actually contain, it's the kind of disparate impact assessment that should be conducted whenever an automated decision system has a consequential impact on people's lives. Employment is clearly an important area, uh, but there are many, many others. If, if, uh, if a system is going to be uh, involved in granting credit or insurance, uh, if, if, it's, if it's going to affect a person's life in a significant way, there should be a disparate impact assessment done. Um, maybe if I can step in as well. Uh, so, so we have been talking about public disclosure here, right? And we have been focusing on bias and that's extremely important, but the public disclosure component of this bill is what makes it unique. Uh, and this is also something that is extremely important for a number of domains, including algorithmic hiring. And algorithmic hiring is going to give us this fertile ground in which to actually try out ideas and make things concrete. This is one of the admittedly failures of the automated decision systems task force on which I served, was uh, trying to boil the ocean and not actually delivering on anything concrete. And this is what we can do here. So in terms of actually developing disclosure mechanisms, my favorite idea here mm -hmm. is based on this metaphor of a nutritional label that can be used to explain outcomes to individuals about why they were or weren't hired. Most likely they will want, why, want to know why they weren't hired. It can be used to explain specific features that were used to decide on their candidacy and not just list these features, but actually explain why these features are relevant, deemed relevant for their performance on the job. Because if I'm denied employment, I don't want to know that this is because my name is not Jared and I don't play lacrosse. This is an anecdote that many of us are familiar with of, of these tools actually exhibiting bias in this way. What I do want to know is what were these features? Show me a label. To what extent do they impact my success or my failure to get this position? And there's more that I can say, but I'm happy to uh, let others speak. Yeah, I would like to um, uh, respond as well. I think that um, what we're looking at is a technology that's at one part of this employment relationship, the hiring um, relationship. Um, Majority Leader Combo was mentioned before that she's got a bill, a pay equity bill. Pay equity analyses of firms are also an audit technology. Um, and um, most firms keep those very, the results of those audits very close to the vest. Um, they don't um, um, make them uh, publicly available. Um, uh, Dr. Poli um, talked before about um, if, if uh, the EEOC worked like the uh, Food and Drug Administration, we'd have a lot more transparency. Um, actually, the history of the EEOC, um, there's a, um, a great deal of um, confidentiality was granted to firms um, back in 1964. If the EOC had been founded in 1972 when the Environmental Protection Agency was founded or OSHA, um, we would know exactly what the firms are doing. 
Um, and I actually think that it's the leadership of local, local uh, cities and states that's going to um, increase transparency. Um, just uh, two weeks ago, the state of California mandated pay data collection which the Trump, um, from firms, which the Trump administration had um, um, stopped. Um, that the EEOC had uh, just begun. Um, I think it's cities like New York and states like California, they're gonna lead the way. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Holden, do you have more questions? Uh, I don't, thank you panel. Terrific, terrific testimony. I, and I, we really appreciate it. I, I mean, I, I think we we skip we skip my testimony, so I'm happy to start now or, or however you prefer. You can start now. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry. Sorry about uh, that. No, not a problem. Not Starting time. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Holden and members of the committee. My name is uh, Stephen Kuyan from the Tannen School of Engineering. Uh, I'm the director of entrepreneurship uh, at Tandon. Uh, where I oversee the Tandon Future Labs and, uh, as Julie mentioned, uh, work with her at the Center for Responsible AI. I'm also an investor and advisor to uh, numerous startups, uh, board member of the Business Incubator Association of New York State, uh, and I'm a member of the U.S. Council for Competitiveness. Uh, my hope is that my perspective comes from launching the first New York City-sponsored incubator in 2009 that helped early-stage companies successfully translate technology investments, including AI and ADS, into successful commercially viable project products uh, for markets hungry for optimization, efficiency, and scale. Uh, ensuring AI can transfer from lab to market is going to be one of the biggest economic opportunities of our generation, uh, and one that is instrumental for the health of our startup ecosystem here uh, in New York City uh, and the competitiveness uh, of our country. Without oversight and regula uh, regulation, uh, wealth from AI will be concentrated in companies that are able to harness and deploy it uh, and that's already happening. Just think about the companies that we go to for our everyday needs. Um, uh, as such, AI must be deployed responsibly, ethically, uh, and with transparency if it's to reach the promise of scale uh, in a wide array of critical sectors, uh, like maybe discussed today, medicine, mobility, education, banking, law, and employment. Uh, and without the public oversight and well-tailored regulation, current conditions indicate that AI will evolve in the dark and sold on the quality uh, of uh, marketing campaigns. Um, uh, so I'd like to sort of make two quick recommendations uh, based on uh, 1894. Um, the first is focused on the data assets that companies have. So most data assets that a company currently uh, have are being considered for AI solutions and technologies as vendors are developing and deploying such tools without any oversight as to how the data influences future decisions uh, on any dimension other than generating uh, more revenue. And today, uh, there's no agreed upon standard in place uh, that allows for third party uh, regulatory industry validation uh, by cities or, or nonprofits and the like. Uh, so companies buy into this over promise of efficient results without any knowledge of what's under the hood uh, or, or what it means to enforce accountability and due process. And that leads to my second point, which is most companies like the ones that are incubated within the NYU 10 and Future Labs and most other uh, startups that employ these tools are not aware of the liability and responsibility that is instilled in them when they purchase these solutions, um, not understanding that they're liable for the decisions. We have one such uh, example of a company that works with us at the Center for uh, Responsible AI that, uh, has, that gives buildings in New York City a grade based on uh, data that's available uh, from various departments within New York City and reviews. Uh, and they know full well the building owners will hold the company liable for any mistakes that their system makes. Um, uh, and it's rare for a company like this one uh, to have gone out and uh, received a uh, Time expired. Uh, algorithmic audit. Um, and it took well over a year to do so. Uh, and the liability that they face is very similar to the liability automated decision systems uh, and hiring will face. And so my recommendation at the council uh, through such organizations as our Center for Responsible AI ensures that companies that purchase these systems understand the liability that uh, is uh, instilled in them when they purchase these systems. Let me please close uh, by offering uh, some closing remarks. Uh, uh, we know that public education is, uh, efforts, are, as Julie mentioned, are critical. Uh, uh, of consumers surveyed, not just within our uh, projects, but uh, generally 62% said they would put a higher trust in companies whose AI interactions they perceive as ethical. And the inverse is true when they're not uh, seen as ethical. New York City uh, needs to uh, enact this bold vision for the deployment of these tools 
uh, as it aligns with societal norms as we expect to see in the future we all want to live in. 1894 may not be perfect as we are discussing today, um, but it's a necessity uh, for automated decision systems to have better utility uh, and ultimately for the continued research and the adoption of AI. The time to do this is now, otherwise we risk getting too far and facing a backlash towards AI that will risk our global position as an innovation hub here in New York uh, and globally, or worse, not having the opportunity to ever enforce these systems again, similar to the world's inability to have any oversight over the AI recommendation tools that power our social media platforms. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And at this point, I do not see any questions from council members. And therefore, we're going to move to our next panel. And our next panel will be Daniel Schwartz, Christopher Boyle, Albert Fox Kahn, and Sarah Mayers West. Mr. Schwartz, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Starting my time. My name is Daniel Schwartz, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the New York Civil Liberties Union. We thank the council members for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Automated decision, decision systems, or ADS, risk severely undermining the civil, human, and privacy rights of New Yorkers. The use of ADS is often accompanied by an acute power imbalance between those deploying these systems and those affected by them, particularly given that ADS operate without transparency or even the most basic legal protections. Especially when New Yorkers fundamental rights are at stake, such as in welfare, education, employment, housing, healthcare, the family regulation system, or the criminal legal system, these technologies all too often replicate and amplify bias, discrimination, and harm towards populations who have been and continue to be disproportionately impacted by bias and discrimination. Women, Black, Indigenous, and all people of color, religious, religious and ethnic minorities, LGBTQIA people, people living in poverty, people with disabilities, people who are or have been incarcerated, and other marginalized communities. To close the overwhelming information gap around these tools, the council could strengthen and pass intro 1806, which would require agencies to provide information about every ADS in use. Other cities have shown the feas feasibility of similar efforts. For example, Amsterdam and Helsinki recently launched their respective ADS registries. Yet transparency is only a first step. Regulation should include mandatory, independent, racial and non-discrimination impact assessments, data privacy audits and holistic consultation with domain experts and affected people, in particular from marginalized groups. Finally, the council should recognize that technologies showing significant discriminatory impact require outright bans, in particular in high stake areas mentioned beforehand. On intro 1894, the NYCLU commends the sponsor and the council for raising and attempting to tackle the issue of bias and discrimination in employment ADS. Unfortunately, intro 1894 does not sufficiently achieve this goal and we oppose it in its current form. In our written testimony, we offer specific recommendations and amendments regarding the bill's sole focus on sale, the limited definition of employment ADS, the leeway to vendors in the bias audit, the notice requirement, the importance of a private right of action, as well as the provision of attorney's fees, and lastly, the inclusion of a non-retaliation provision. Without these amendments, the legislation will not deliver on its promise to mitigate bias and bring justice and equity to the world of hiring ADS. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your testimony. And we go to our next panelist, and our next panelist is Christopher Boyle. Mr. Boyle, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You yes. might be uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Start in time. Uh, thank you, Chairman Holden and council members for holding this hearing. My name is Christopher Boyle. I'm the director of data research and policy at New York County Defender Services. We are a public defense office that represents New Yorkers in thousands of cases in Manhattan's criminal and Supreme Courts every year. Automated decision systems are routinely used to inform actions at every step of the legal system. While a primary objective of such programs is to eliminate the effects of the race or class biases, Numerous studies have shown that without proper oversight, risk assessments unintentionally amplify these biases under the guise of science. This summer, the council passed the POST Act, a bill that requires NYPD to disclose their use of surveillance technologies. The first disclosure by the NYPD will be due in early 2021. And this bill is critical to help us understand what technology the NYPD relies on to surveil our clients and communities. The POST Act is a long overdue reform that NYCDS 
strongly supports, but the city still has a long way to go. At present, we do not have access to information regarding how many ADSs are used in New York City in the criminal legal system, nor do we know for what purposes they are being implemented, and this must change. Earlier this year, I testified before this committee in favor of two bills related to reporting on automated decision systems used by city agencies. To date, these bills have not been passed, and I urge this committee to bring these bills to a vote. NYCDS strongly supports intro 1894-2020, a bill on today's agenda that would regulate the use of automated employment decision tools, AEDTs in the hiring process. The bill would require both pre-sale and freely post-sale audits for bias, require employment candidates to be notified within 30 days if the AEDT was used to assess their candidacy and for what specific purpose and impose a penalty for non-compliance. We believe that initiative 1894 will help to protect people from bias from the AEDTs, yet we urge to consider the council to consider the following two things. First, this bill, which is limited to employment hiring context, goes a lot further than the POST Act or the transparency bills considered by this committee in January. We strongly believe that people should be protected from bias when seeking employment, but we also believe that this same level of protection should be extended to people facing the loss of their liberty in the criminal legal system. The technology covered by the POST Act does not cover algorithmic tools created and used by the non-police actors in the system. Such tools include risk assessment tools where outputs are used by judges to make bail determinations or the DNA software like StarMix, licensed by our crime lab to attempt to interpret complex DNA mixtures in criminal cases. We urge you to consider introducing and passing a bill similar to intro 1894 to apply to the criminal legal system. Second, you should consider amending intro 1894 to not only include a language about regular audits for bias, but also to make clear that these AEDTs, even where propriety must be subject to under the hood examination by independent experts without non-disclosure agreements or other such impediments to a full and fair evaluation. Flawed algorithmic decision systems can have real life consequences. For example, Star Mix is software that uses algorithmic systems to interpret complex DNA mixtures and analysis. Time expired. In 2015, an error in the underlying star mix code led to problems in 60 criminal cases in Australia. The problem was only discovered in the midst of a criminal trial where prosecutors sought to include its faulty results as evidence. As defense attorneys, we require access to the source code to ensure that star mix analysis should be relied upon by the court. An order for bias, while important, is not sufficient to protect against harm. To truly protect the public, we must access the underlying source codes too. We ask for the same protection to be included in any legislation extended to the types of protections in this bill, to algorithms used at various stages in the criminal legal system process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Boyle, and our, for your testimony. And our next panelist is Albert Fox Khan. Mr. Khan, please state your name and affiliation. For the record, you may begin when you're ready. Starting time. Thank you so much. My name is Albert Fox Khan. I'm the founder and executive director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. I'm also a fellow at NYU Law School's Engelberg Center on Innovation Law. Uh, and I'm very grateful that uh, uh, the uh, majority leader Combo has taken a leadership effort in trying to address the impact of ADS on biased hiring here in, in New York, and both as a lawyer who has fought and, you know, uh, employment discrimination throughout my career and also as a resident of District 35. But I'm also one of the 12 signatories to the letter that was circulated on behalf of civil rights groups that strongly oppose the passage of this bill in its current form. Let me be clear that if we pass 1894 as it is worded today, it will be a rubber stamp for some of the worst forms of algorithmic discrimination. It does too little to provide the safeguards claimed, and it will give so many of these firms a way to sell their, their products with a veneer of legitimacy when really these protections are ineffective and insufficient. Having internal audits conducted by companies on their own software is allowing the fox to guard the hen house. It does not give us an accurate assessment of the impact that these tools have. It does not give us a meaningful way to combat bias in automated decision systems. And, and despite all of the claims that ADS can counter human bias, the track record is far from uh, persuasive. We see that ADS can be just as biased, if not more biased, than human decision-making. That 
when we allow this technology into our hiring process, we put the livelihoods of millions of New Yorkers at risk. And we have to have stronger protections because if we put this bill forward as it is drafted today, it will be a selling point for people who can pass this minimum level of due diligence to move forward in selling their flawed software to employers and really giving New Yorker, uh, robbing New Yorkers of their day in court when they face uh, discrimination. We need a private right of action. We need attorney's fees. We need this to apply to government hiring as well, making sure that city employees have the exact same rights as private employees under this bill. We need to have a banned list that prohibits the use of any ADS that has been found to be biased in the prior 12 months. And we need a much more comprehensive framework for what constitutes inappropriate bias in hiring systems. This, this is a hard thing to do. I, you know, I've been trying to help the city with this for multiple years, including previously through uh, work with the uh, Automated Decision Systems Task Force. I know it is not easy to define these terms and to lay out uh, solutions, but we have to do better. We need to listen to advocates. I urge the council to incorporate the feedback from the signatories to this letter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan, for your testimony. And we're going to our next panelist. And our next panelist is Sarah Mayers West. Ms. Mayers West, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Good afternoon, Chair Holden Sorry. and members of uh, and the members of the Committee on Technology. My name is Dr. Sarah Myers West, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the AI Now Institute an interdisciplinary research center at New York University that focuses on the social implications of artificial intelligence. Um, the city council's scrutiny of the space is particularly needed in a moment where workers are facing increasing precarity in the wake of the pandemic. It's critical that regulation of this space be designed to provide the support that workers will need in protecting themselves against employment discrimination. In July, the AI Now Institute joined 23 other civil rights, employment, and privacy organizations by signing a set of civil rights principles for hiring assessment technologies. Building on these principles, my testimony makes two primary points. One, that this is a space in urgent need of increased accountability and oversight. Two, that bias as it surfaces in these tools cannot be separated out from historic and present day patterns of employment discrimination. And in fact, that the research suggests that these tools could introduce new forms of bias. The tools that INT 1894 aims to regulate are already in wide use across a wide range of industries and job categories. And in the absence of clear standards of oversight and evaluation, these systems are already being used to make important decisions throughout the entire hiring process from who gets targeted with a job ad to who might be called in for an interview to what salary might be offered to a candidate. Candidates are often unaware when these systems are in use. Um, they're unaware of what qualifications would be taken into account when making decisions about whether or not they get a job. Um, and thus they're, uh, they're unable to identify or marshal the necessary evidence when discrimination takes place, let alone aggregate the data across multiple individuals necessary to challenge it. But while transparency and disclosure are very important steps toward ensuring accountability in the use of automated employment decision tools, they're really only the first of many. Studies of these systems raise significant doubt as to whether they work as advertised and even more concerningly, they suggest that they may in fact introduce other new forms of employment discrimination. Uh, other panelists have brought up discrimination on the basis of disability, class. I would also um, bring up access to technology. Um, at present, there is also a worrying lack of well-defined best practices as to appropriate methods for debiasing or auditing these systems. We also lack sufficient information about how vendors audits work in practice in order to make an independent assessment of their effectiveness in mitigating discriminatory outcomes. Given their prevalence, it's thus deeply concerning how little we know about whether automated employment decisions systems work, let alone what kinds of harms they introduce. Thus, while the INT 1894 bill addresses an area sorely in need of close Time scrutiny, expired. 
Uh, we are concerned that at present, this bill could allow for the perpetuation of discriminatory hiring practices and in the end, legitimize tools that could even compound their effects. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now I will turn over for, to our chair for questions. Thank you. It's another great panel. Um, uh, I, I think we're all hearing that from this panel that the, the, they support the bill, but it doesn't go far enough. So uh, certainly your recommendations, um, if you can give us some testimony that we, we'd like to uh, obviously look at that. Um, I'd like to ask this panel, do the penalties listed in the proposed bill, um, does it do enough to uh, encourage compliance in, in your you know, estimation. Um, Chair Holden, um, I, I think that this will just make uh, discriminatory AI, it will make the penalties the price of doing business. Right. We need much uh, stronger penalties. We need to have a private right of action. We need to have attorney's fees so we can mobilize the private bar, just as we do with every other form of uh, employment discrimination in New York. Uh, and at a time when the agencies are uh, admittedly uh, uh, resource starved when they're struggling to keep up with their other responsibilities. We need that sort of private uh, sector enforcement as part of uh, any campaign. But I, I think part of the difficulty here is under the text of the bill itself, it wouldn't even be illegal to use biased AI. You would simply need to uh, conduct the audit, but the employer to use these biased systems wouldn't be exposed to any liability under the bill itself. So just, just putting a monetary uh, penalty doesn't go far enough. What, you, uh, are you looking for something else, sanctions or? Uh, it, it, so I, I do think monetary penalty is enough, but it's the type of monetary penalty. So well, it's what having- would say, What would you say is like the, the starting point? 5,000, 10,000? I, I, I think if you have, uh, a liquidated damages or um, that sort of um, you know statutory damages of a uh, five thousand ten thousand per violation that that would be great. But I think what we need to make sure is not just that you have those uh, that damages amount specified, but that you also have the the frequent enforcement of having the plaintiffs bar constantly being uh, mobilized when employees come forward and uh, complain about uh, biased uh, hiring. Great, thank you. Anyone else have any more questions? I do not see any questions. Chair Holden, do you have any final words for the panelists? I just want to thank them again. It's a terrific panel. And I, we'd like to be in touch with this, uh, the panelists here and, and all the panelists, by the way, has been uh, great. And um, so we're, you know, we're saying we have a lot of work to do, but uh, um, I, I particularly want to talk about, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of these other bills that were suggested and move, start, start to advance that because we're, we're behind the curve already. But thank you, panelists. Thanks so much for your testimony. Thank you very much, Councilmember Holden and the panelists. And we would like to move to our next panel. And our next panel will be Aileen Ria, Kelsey Markey, and Lauren Darzino. Ms. Ria, you can state your name and affiliation for your record. Hello, my name is Aileen Ray. My name is Aline Rang. I'm a longtime resident of New York City. I'm also a graduate student at the NYU Center for Data Science and a fellow at the Center for Responsible AI. I'm here to voice my support of proposed bill number 1894. The need for the audits proposed in the bill is plain. Lack of regulations surrounding automated hiring tools has created dangerous loopholes through which companies can evade our city's non-discrimination laws, often unknowingly and without malice. The power of these tools to operate at massive scale demands rigorous scrutiny. I offer the following recommendations for refinement of the proposed audit procedure. Audits ought to be conducted independently by people with specific expertise in employment law, data ethics, and algorithmic fairness. Audits should not be tainted by conflicts of interest. The outcome of an audit ought to explicitly qualify or disqualify the legal use of the tools by employers within New York City. Guidelines for disqualification should be carefully developed by collaboration between experts from relevant domains. 
The penalty for violations of the proposed bill ought to be a progressive fine, which increases with the valuation of the offending firm. A $500 fine may be sufficient deterrent for a small business, but there's no reason to think that a $500 fine or even a series of $1,500 fines would cause a multi-billion dollar company to alter its hiring practices. Audits ought to prioritize fairness metrics, which speak to the interests of applicants rather than the interests of employers or vendors. As other panelists have mentioned, there's federal precedent for using adverse impact to define employment discrimination. In addition to adverse impact, I suggest that audits include subgroup error rate analysis. I refer the council to my extended written testimony for an explanation of these metrics. Audits ought to look not only at a tool's decisions, but also at the data on which the tool is trained. Machine learning depends on the use of a training data set, which teaches the tool how to make its decisions. Training data is often tainted by systemic historical bias, which can infect any tool which is trained on it. Firms should be required to defend the use of training data which contains bias or which does not approximate the demographics of the applicant pool or of New York City at large. Audits ought to include an accounting of exactly which features or data points about an applicant are being used as input to the decision system, as well as information about which of these features are most important to the system's decisions. Audits ought to investigate the use of proxy variables by these algorithms. For example, consider a tool that does not use the protected category of race, but does use zip code. The model may learn to use zip code as a proxy for race and to discriminate against certain zip codes which correspond to ethnic enclaves. In addition to um, sharing audit results with employers and applicants, the full results of each audit should be made publicly available in accessible language. Incorporating these recommendations into the proposed bill would close the loopholes which are currently allowing companies to violate our civil rights under the guise of objective decision making and would hold accountable the vendors employers responsible via their negligence for perpetuating this injustice. With the proposed bill, New York City is, is poised to bring our decades long history of leadership and protection into a new era. I commend the authors of the bill and thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you very much. We're moving on to our next panelist, and our next panelist is Kelsey Marquet. Ms. Marquet, you can state your name and, affili and affiliation for the record. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Morning, My Tom. name is Kelsey Marquet. I am a master's student at New York University studying data science and AI, and I am also part of a research team there investigating bias and stability in these hiring tools. I'm very excited to hear that New York City is considering this important bill. As a soon-to-be graduate, I am frequently subjected to various types of these hiring systems. These tools are used on me and other applicants to screen our resumes, to run background checks, or to analyze our social media profiles. They're also sometimes used as personality tests to see if a candidate will be a good fit at a company, and they're even used for video interviews. My longer testimony had an anecdote about my experience with these video interviews, which I will submit along with my written testimony and I'm happy to discuss more. However, through my research, I have become very wary of these hiring systems and their lack of transparency. This is because time and time again, I have seen in my courses, research and work, how easy it is to make a biased decision system. To address Majority Leader Combo's question about how bias is introduced to a system, I'd like to mention that this can happen at many parts of the data pipeline, and it is often done without malice or intention. It can be introduced in the data that is used to build a system, as we might expect to see for a data set of a workforce that is historically lower numbers of women and people of color. It can also come from the features that the system uses for analysis. For example, if these features are suggested of protected classes like gender, race, or disability. Bias can also be introduced in the validation through the data or method that is used to determine if the algorithm is working as expected. And it can also be introduced to the technical implementation of the system, such as if the tool is applied to all candidates or just some. As part of my data science education, I have learned how to assess systems for potential bias throughout the data pipeline. However, when tools such as these are completely unavailable to the public, none of these questions can be answered. Transparency of these hiring systems is essential because it ensures accountability to the public and it facilitates audits by experienced computer and data scientists. This country has long said that discrimination is not welcome in hiring. So I ask you today, why are we not also holding these algorithms to the same standards? My recommendations for this bill are as follows. First, as suggested, these tools should be a subject for an audit for bias at a minimum of every year by an impartial outside auditor trained in issues of data ethics and responsibility. 
I also recommend that these audits have predetermined metrics that they must meet for quantifying what is an acceptable level of bias in the system. Also, because it's been suggested on this call, I will emphasize the importance of the impartial auditor in this. It is an obvious conflict of interest for these audits to be done by the companies who create and sell these tools. Secondly, this bill suggests that companies should make known, quote, the job qualifications or characteristics for which the tool is used to screen. However, I would recommend making clear not just what the tool is looking for, but also which features are being given to the system to determine these qualifications. And finally, as suggested here by others, I agree that there should be a thoughtful mechanism for the public to report the possible use of these hiring tools. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. And our next panelist on this panel is Lauren Darzino. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin when you're ready. Starting Good time. afternoon, and thank you, Chair Holden and the committee. My name is Lauren Diorenzo, and I'm also a master's student at New York University where I study data science and AI. I'm also part of a team at New York University conducting research on using data science responsibly, as well as the bias and stability of hiring algorithms. In this testimony, I would like to express my support for Bill 1894 and to propose some suggestions to add to its concreteness and improve its intended goals. First, I would like to highlight the need for the regulation of automated decision systems used in hiring spaces. As a current job seeker and applicant, it is unsettling to me that a future employer might disregard my application based on the output of an algorithm that has not been rigorously tested for unfair impact or unstable results by an independent third party, and that I might not even be informed of its use. As a student, I've received my fair share of job and internship rejections in my undergraduate and graduate careers. How many of them were because my output from an automated decision system did not meet the threshold of the ideal output? How are employers even defining these thresholds for a position when many of these tools output is a prediction of personality traits? Why are vendors advertising predictive personality assessments as proxies for qualities of a good employee? And how specifically are these tools measuring the accuracy of their predictions? These are all questions that policymakers should be asking both the vendors who make these tools and the employers who use them uh, before they're allowed to impact someone's ability to get a job. What worries me most is that had I not been recruited into a project explicitly doing research in this space, I would likely not have even known that these types of tools are regularly used by Fortune 500 companies. Um, how many job applicants have had important life outcomes, employment decisions, influenced by the output of these tools and aren't even aware of it. To supplement my support of this bill, I would also like to suggest concrete mechanisms of how to audit these tools, not just with regard to bias as mentioned in the bill, but also to stability. Many of these tools claim to predict personality, which behavioral psychology literature will support is something that remains relatively stable over time. As such, if a candidate is assessed by a tool at two different time points, the output should be similar. It is also important for a tool predicting personality to be platform agnostic. That is, if a candidate's resume was used in the system, it should produce similar results as, as the output as if their LinkedIn was being used in the system. Otherwise, how can there be any confidence that either output is an accurate description of a candidate's personality and their then perceived fitness for a position? Without regulation, automated decision systems that affect real people's livelihood can have adverse consequences. In summary, I recommend that the city council adopt a form of bill 1894, but with stronger language surrounding what it means to audit a tool and with specific detail about both fairness and stability. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now I'm going to turn it to council member Holden for questions. Thank you all for your testimony. I, I, I want to ask the graduate students, I want to thank you, by the way, but it's to me, listening to your testimony, the graduate students, it's frightening that what you're facing, I didn't have to face that. Um, you know, we worked on our resumes, we sent them out, and usually we got a call. This is kind of frightening that, so did, in your investigations uh, in graduate school, have you done any where you tested a resume? Um, for you know a certain uh, uh, let's say uh, ads and and discovered what not to put on your resume what not to do in social media i mean there this is kind of um this is certainly big brother <laughs> uh 
Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's certainly very frightening. But I, I, again, just listening to your testimony, I'm just glad I'm not trying to get into the job market anymore because, um, and, I, and, I, and I really, you know, this makes me want to advance this legislation even faster, hearing your stories. Uh, and if you, if you can tell us any personal stories that you've had um, with the resume or, or just being denied access or being cut off from a job um, that you, you had no idea that the ADS or AI was, was even working or operating. Anybody can answer. I, I can I can take the the first part of that. So we the three of us actually are working on a project right now um, for our capstone project for our masters, where we are looking at some of these personality based uh, hiring tools. Their tools um, we're looking at two ones specifically that uh, purport to predict your personality based on your resume or your LinkedIn profile or your Twitter handle. And companies will use these before they decide who to hire. They will just give your public Twitter or LinkedIn or resume, and it'll say what type of person you are. And you will somehow base that um, information. You will compare it to the people that currently work at your, uh, at your job, and you will see if they will be a good fit for it. Um, we are in the process of, of running these tools where we're getting approval right now to do human subjects research. And, uh, using these tools on some students from the NYU student body. So we will have more information on that. Um, but we can all, I'm sure, talk about how these tools have also been used on us as graduate students who are applying for jobs and entering the workforce. Um, I specifically had really a really interesting uh, experience with a video tool being used on me last spring, where I, um, we, like, we typically, after we apply, we do a data science, like assessment skills test. And then after that, um, actually, I'll just read my testimony. After that, I was asked for an additional assessment to examine my communication skills. Uh, this assessment asked me to record myself on video, responding to questions, and it gave me very specific guidance. This guidance included things like to speak naturally and dress as I would for an in-person interview, standard things that would convey my level of professionalism and communication skills. However, it also had some more unusual points, like how my video should be well lit with a neutral background, how I should not wear any prints or have any clutter around, and that I should maintain eye contact and smile throughout the video. As a data scientist, these things popped out at me as suggestions that a machine might be using to better detect and analyze my actions. After further investigation, I learned that video tools like these are increasingly common in analyzing potential job candidates that likely my facial movements, word choice, and speaking voice was being used to compare me to other applicants and to give me a score based on how employable I was. I personally, as someone who has struggled with anxiety and nervousness much of my life, was terrified. What if I had a nervous shake in my voice or a tremble in my hands? Would that mark me as non-employable? What about non-native speakers who had accents or different vocabularies? And the, the whole point of was I being told not to wear distracting prints? Was this because the system was somehow parsing out my skin color or body shape? I mean, I'll, I'll leave the rest for, for my testimony, but I'll, I'll just point out that like there are so many questions about these things and, and there is no knowledge known about how they're being used on us and just rampant possibility for discrimination, which is why these audits are very important. This is frightening. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, panel. Great, great, great information. I appreciate it. Good luck uh, in graduate school and uh, good, good luck finding a job. Uh, it, it is, uh, we're gonna try to make it easier, but based on your input, uh, we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do not see any more questions. And now I would like to move to our next panel. And our next panel will be Kirsten, John Foy, Arva Rice, and Andrew Hamilton. Kirsten, John Foy, please, you may begin when you're ready. And please state your name and affiliation for the record. Thank you. Sure, it is Reverend Party Kirsten, time. John Foy. I am the president and CEO of the Arc of Justice. We are a national civil rights organization based in New York City. I want to uh, thank the Technology Committee and the staff of the Council for permitting me to share 
our thoughts on such groundbreaking legislation. Uh, I want to bring greetings to my fellow panelists, uh, certainly uh, Arva Rice and others. Each of our group has seen and experienced the wreckage of the pandemic on New York public health and economy firsthand. And of course, we are doing all that we can to get New Yorkers back on their feet, back at jobs and able to thrive in the city. But our work alone will be hardly sufficient in ensuring a fair recovery in all five boroughs. That's why we implore the Technology Committee and the entire New York City Council to pass intro 1894. The shaky recovery is underway and we have no time to waste to make sure it is equitable. Slowly but surely, companies in the city are hiring workers once again. And increasingly, companies are using automated technologies to guide their hiring decisions. Large companies in particular can receive hundreds of applications for a single job opening. New technologies can scale the evaluation process without requiring individuals to shift and sift through resume after resume. But just as human biases have led to job discrimination against people of color and women for generations, hiring technologies can also lead to unfair outcomes. However, we are confident that this legislation will reduce discrimination in hiring by requiring that vendors audit their technology annually to show whether their offerings are leading to hiring decisions that do not have an adverse impact on people of color and women. Job applicants seeking employment during one of the worst economic periods ever for our city should not have the additional worry uh, and burden of being discriminated against through technology. With mandated audits, these technologies will actually be an improvement over the traditional ways most companies now hire, provided that we have the appropriate regulation as it represented in 1894. And job applicants also deserve to know how they are being evaluated for an opening. For so much of our lives, we have assumed that HR reps are reviewing our resumes, assessing our skills during interviews and calling our references. But with artificial intelligence now playing a role, applicants should know these new systems are conducting the reviews. That's why we are appreciative of the city council requiring that all job applicants be given notice when employers are subjecting them to automated technologies. The legislation comes at a critical and crucial time for our communities. New York's off overlooked residents play an integral role in New York's economy, culture, I'm and expired. But they have never fully enjoyed the fruits of the city's economic largesse. This law will help change that paradigm. We need to encourage companies to choose workers based on their skills and experience, not on how they look or the zip code from whence they come. We are also thrilled that two black women who represent where so many of our clients and our constituents and our neighbors live, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo and Council Member Alika Amprey Samuels are spearheading efforts to pass this bill. Technology should serve everyone equally and we are inspired to see technology policy being led by women of color who are often forced to the sidelines of this industry. We hope their leadership serves as an example for legislators of color throughout the nation. Thank you again to Chair Holden, the entire committee, and the 20 council members who are focused on rebuilding a stronger and more equitable New York City economy and regulating technology with respect to ensuring equity in the job market. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to move to the next panelist, and then we'll going to open for questions. And our next panelist is Arva Rice. Ms. Rice, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Thank you. Starting time. I think she is still muted. Ms. Rice, could you unmute yourself? Okay. Um, okay, you're unmuted now. Good. All right. All right. Let me try that again. Start in time. Oh, it's good. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me uh, let me uh, start again. 
I'm Arva Rice, President and CEO of the New York Urban League. Uh, thank you to Chair Holden and the Technology Committee for holding a hearing on such a forward-thinking bill that we no doubt better protect workers who have been historically discriminated against. Our organization is currently celebrating its centennial, an achievement we are proud of, and one we are using to redouble our efforts to bring meaningful improvement to the lives of Black New Yorkers. To mark the occasion, we are releasing a comprehensive report on November 22nd, the state of Black New York. The report reveals deep racial disparities in the city and also makes specific policy recommendations to guarantee a fairer New York City emerges from the ashes of this pandemic. Among our core policy proposals is getting behind the passage of intro 1894. That's because I see discrimination in hiring all the time. Specifically, the New York Urban League works with too many talented and bright young professionals who never get calls back. I recently referred young, one young person who was bilingual to a, to a fintech company, but they couldn't, but he would not even get a return call. They ultimately landed a job elsewhere where they were promoted twice in less than one year. Indeed, far too many companies fail to take black and brown job applicants seriously. Earlier this fall, Wells Fargo's CEO blamed the lack of diversity in corporate America on the lack of qualified black workers in the talent pipeline. The assumption here is that there is nothing inherently wrong with the process large companies use to screen job candidates. According to this perspective, employers can set whatever standards they want for prospective applicants, even if those standards perpetuate systemic inequality. In addition, I recently explained the importance of this legislation in a Blavity opinion piece I co-authored with your colleague, Councilwoman Alika Amprey Samuel. As Councilmember Amprey Samuel has shared, she would, she would occasionally whiten her resume from Alika to Alicia prior to her career as an elected official to increase her chances of getting a call back for an interview. Her experience is backed by numerous studies. When a person with a white sounding name submits their resume, they receive 50% more callbacks over someone with a black sounding name. Many people of color have internalized this bias against us and it damages our self-worth and our self-esteem as a result. So whether or not employees are willing to admit it, there's a real problem with how black workers are evaluated. Beyond unconscious bias creeping into how resumes are traditionally reviewed, referral programs also keep certain workers down. Over one third of US workers get their current job from a referral, but a black woman is 35% less likely to get this kind of boost than a white man in a similar position. So after decades of not seeing real improvement in workplace diversity or pay equity, we need to accelerate our efforts and push our culture to reevaluate hiring so that all New Yorkers, not just the privileged few, have a fair shot in hearing the magic words, you're hired. I'm exposed. Thank you for, hopefully this testimony has made plain that employees need to stop blaming unqualified candidates and start questioning their hiring process. And that's why this bill is so unique. It will guide companies towards a better and more equitable way of choosing job candidates. Thank you for the opportunity to share my support for law 1894-2020. Thank you. Thank you very much again for your testimony. We have one more panelist on this panel and then we'll open for questions. And I see that we already have questions. And our next panelist is Andrew Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Starting time. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Hamilton. I am the president of the National Black MBA Association Metro New York chapter. I'd like to thank everyone allowing me to talk and, and testify from my point of view why this bill is so important. I'm here to share the support for 1894-2020, um, for the sale of automated employment decision tools. The Black MBA, Association, Black MBA Association, which was founded over 50 years ago, the New York chapter over 26 years ago, is all about uplifting Black professionals and connecting members the jobs they deserve. Our initiatives include career fairs, education opportunities, and mentorship. Since COVID, we have expanded our efforts by tripling our frequency of virtual drop job fairs in New York. Attendance has tripled with over 500, member, 500 people attending in September, 2020. My role is a volunteer position, but I also work tirelessly with over 200 companies to move the needle in job placement and creation in New York City. Eight, 1894, perfectly aligns with our mission 
by ensuring that all job applicants are treated fairly and not judged by the color of their skin, but by their qualifications. This bill is particularly essential now because it has been extensively covered by companies are increasingly evaluating workers using new and automated tools. While some of these tools are built for fairness in mind, some are not, including those are facial recognition to screen candidates. However, facial recognition concerns in hiring date back well before outbreak, specifically in 2020, and then Senator Kamala Harris and then, Sen then Senator Elizabeth Warren and Patty Murray wrote a letter to the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to express their concerns over the mounting evidence that facial recognition is having unfair advantage for the job seekers. The letter stated facial recognition amplifies discrimination and that such disparities can encode magnify gender, racial, and other inequities that, that, are, are, that are normally human. To combat, combat the potential potential uh, problem, the Senate requested the EOC develop guidelines for uh, employers for fair use for facial recognition. Unsurprisingly, this bill has not been passed. But, but perhaps now with, Ms., uh, with, uh, with Vice President-elect Harris, there could be um, more spotlight on this bill to get passed. The issue isn't facial recognition. Look at the, what happened with Amazon, sought to automate the resume review, which was already a problematic way of assessing job applicants. When someone resume, they, when they review someone's resume, they tend to be someone's qualifications on racial and gender cues, as such as their name and where they live and where culture they come from. Studies have shown that white workers have gotten more callbacks for interviews versus black, uh, black workers with identical job descriptions and job backgrounds. The fact that some hiring technologies are harmful and others are not in New York legislation is so important without this bill there's a real risk that discrimination against people of color and women will be impacting New York workers for the foreseeable future. While many employers have made, recently made comments to increasingly diversity in the workforce, they do not currently have information they need to judge whether the hiring tool will help or hinder the progress of this process. What I need to, H-94 specific does not enforce vendors of hiring technology to proactively evaluate the products with biases. The legislation will ensure that employers will use these products and receive annual reports to justify what they're doing and making sure everything is act acting accordingly. More importantly, this bill needs to be passed to, to, to move the needle in a post-COVID environment. And I hope that my testimony is able to shed some light on this issue. Thank you for allowing me to testify this time. Thank you very much for your testimony. And I will now turn over to our chair and majority leader combo for questions. Another excellent panel. Uh, I'd like to just defer to uh, majority leader. I know she has a question. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to recognize um, Mrs. Rice as well as um, Reverend Foy's comments as far as recognizing the disparities, particularly that women of color are facing um, all across this city and this nation. And I think it's really important that um, this conversation and this hearing continues to happen because there are so many ways that racial disparities continue to impact communities of color. And it's imperative that we get this technology and the AI correct. So that way we can make sure that you know, something that should be designed to create more diversity doesn't do the exact opposite. So I certainly thank them for their testimonies today. Thank you, panel. Thank you. If we do not have any more questions, I would like to move to our next panel. And our next panel will be Ms. McGregor, Ms. Rigetti, um, and Manish, Rahavan, and I apologize if I mis mispronounce any names. And Ms. McGregor, you may state your name and affiliation for the record. Starting time. Hi, my name is Susan McGregor, and I am an associate research scholar at the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. Um, I wanna thank uh, the council for the opportunity to address today. Um, and applaud the New York City Council for undertaking the important work of helping ensure fairness in the use of algorithmic systems in employment practices through the rule under review today and related efforts such as the work of the Automated Decision Systems Task Force. In reading the tests of the rule being discussed, I'd like to encourage the council to consider adding more specific language about the, career, the criteria around bias audits and how meeting this requirement must be satisfied. 
As members of the council may be aware, there are a wide variety of ways that the fairness of an algorithmic system may be measured. In 2018, for example, Princeton professor Arvind Narayana counted at least 21. Just as importantly, it is often mathematically imp impossible for a single system to meet multiple definitions of fair fairness simultaneously, as illustrated by the example of the compass, compass sentencing algorithm, which while it meets one definition of fairness, fails importantly on others with, uh, with disparate impact on different racial and ethnic groups. While requiring regular bias audits for algorithmic employment systems is an important first step, the spirit of this rule may be easily subverted without additional specification about the substance of qualifying audit procedures. At minimum, I would like to suggest that the rule require that any bias audit provide results of the system along multiple measures of fairness, such as those outlined in the work by Professor uh, Narayanan and others, and or developed in consultation with the many experts on this topic who are present in this meeting and who work, study, and or reside in New York City. Thank you very much for your testimony. And our next panelist is Ludovic Rigetti. Yes. Mr. Rigetti. Hi. Uh, Starting thank, time. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. So my name is Ludovic Rigetti. I'm a resident of New York City and I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering and of mechanical and aerospace engineering at New York University. My research focuses on robotics and artificial intelligence, and my laboratory designs algorithms to create fully autonomous systems. I'm a member of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Research and Practice Ethics Committee, and I regularly serve as, civil, as a civilian expert for international organizations, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross and the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research on issues related to the regulations of autonomous weapon systems. I would like to commend the leadership of the council members who are sponsoring the bill that is discussed today. I think this is an important and necessary step to ensure that automated decision systems are used in a transparent and responsible manner, that they lead to a fair treatment of members of our communities, and that companies selling and using such systems are held accountable. It's also important to build trust in our institutions. The growing body of scientific work shows that automated decision systems often exhibit unintended biases Worse, they can actually amplify bias and discrimination and hide them behind the complexity and the wrongly perceived objectivity of technology. The bill is constructed around two strong pillars, uh, bias audit and candidate notice. Both are important, but I see a few potential issues. Concerning bias audit, what will constitute a credible and successful, successful bias audit? It is important that a certain number of criteria be put in place to ensure a meaningful application of the regulation. For example, it might be important to require that the auditor has access to more than just the system treated as a black box. Otherwise, the audit will not find issues a priori, for example, by finding misconceptions in the algorithm or issues in the data used to train the system. The system needs to be transparent to the auditing body. It would need to, the auditing body would need to know what the underlying algorithms that are used for example, to ensure that appropriate bias mitigation techniques have been considered, and second, which data is used to conceive the system, for example, to detect if the data is sufficiently representative, diverse, it does not contain obvious bias. Both algorithmic and transparency is crucial for, to increase the ability to detect potential problems upstream. It is also important to define what is expected from an acceptable audit report. Concerning candidate notice, the disclosure containing the characteristics used to access the candidate should be provided in a legible form. Candidates should be able to understand what these characteristics mean, and they should be able to associate them to their own profile. A lack of legibility, legibility could undermine trust in the process. It might also prevent candidates from seeking remedies from a process they cannot make sense of. I understand that these are complex questions that might not be settled in the bill, but I hope they will be considered for its application. I am glad to see New York City taking the lead on such questions. I support the proposed bill, which will help protect New Yorkers seeking employment from systematic discrimination and provide tools to make, sense, hiring, to make sense of hiring procedures. I hope that the City Council will also go further and continue to set, set stringent standards for fair and beneficial use of automated decision, decision systems. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much for your testimony. And our next panelist is Manish Raghavan. And I apologize if I mispronounced the last name. You want to your name and affiliation for the record. My name is Manish Raghavan. I'm a, I'm a researcher at Cornell University. 
Good afternoon, Chair Holden and the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so as I said, I'm a researcher at Cornell. I study the societal impacts of algorithms, particularly in the context of hiring. And today I'd like to offer up some insights that I've learned through my research over the last several years. Um, first and foremost, I think this effort to bring regulatory scrutiny and transparency to automated decision tools is much needed. We don't yet have a good framework to ensure that these tools don't perpetuate discrimination. And I believe that this bill is a val valuable first step in that process. Uh, in addition to the excellent prior testimony we've heard today, I'd like to spend my time today making two points uh, in which I go into further in the written testimony that I've submitted. Uh, first, I'd like to make the case that without particular standards, audits will fail to be meaningful and to detect important uh, avenues for discrimination that exist. The second thing I'd like to point out is that attempts to audit these algorithms will have inherent limitations and we shouldn't in overlook those limitations. So first, the, uh, I'd like to talk about how this while this bill empowers auditors to assess compliance with applicable employment discrimination laws, we can and should use audits to seek out discrimination more broadly. For example, many of the stories that we read today about algorithmic bias, bias concern systems that don't work very well for marginalized communities. Uh, for example, studies have found that facial and speech recognition systems perform worse for black users than for white users. And the simplified explanation for why this happens is that the tools are primarily built using white users' data, and so they work better for those users. Now, we might be worried that automated decision tools in employment might similarly not work well for those who have not been well represented in the labor market in the past. And in particular, they won't work well for marginalized communities. And while we might find this troubling, this is actually not necessarily illegal by our current standards. Um, so from a technical perspective, determining whether a tool works well for one group compared to another is actually relatively feasible. Um, and it could easily be included in a bias audit. And without specific standards for what should be included in a bias audit, my fear is that they won't be. And so I recommend that the council explicitly provide measures of discrimination that must be included in a bias audit. And in particular that, uh, that we include standards of differential validity uh, or when a tool works well for one group as opposed to another as one of those measures. The second, like, but the second point I'd like to raise is that while an audit may be able to detect certain forms of illegal discrimination, no audit can be comprehensive in this respect. For example, many employers don't maintain data about employees' sexual orientation. And as a result, an audit cannot feasibly detect discrimination on this basis. Now, in my view, we should think of this, an audit of this format is analogous to a health checkup that one might receive from a general practitioner. In the same way that going through a checkup doesn't guarantee perfect health, passing an audit doesn't mean that a tool is completely non-discriminatory. Beyond the audit proposed in this bill, we should continue to scrutinize these tools and their implementation in particular to ensure that they don't perpetuate discrimination. Lastly, I'd like to just raise the importance of the disclosure uh, provision of this bill. I think it needs to be you know, more completely specified in order to, to, in order to ensure that candidates actually get meaningful notice of the disclosure provided for in this bill. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate the council's attention on this important matter and I look forward to seeing this bill progress. Please feel free to contact me if you have further questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And we have one final panelist, Mr. Ron Edwards. Mr. Ron Edwards, I would like to call on you and uh, you might state your name and affiliation for the record. Sure. My name is Ron Edwards, retired from the federal government. I spent more than 40 years working in civil rights and first at the Department of Labor and Labor, and later in the majority of my career at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, over the course of my career, I've learned a lot about hiring procedures and employment screens that act as unnecessary barriers for historically disadvantaged groups, most notably non-whites and women. There are many times in the course of my work on investigations and litigation action when it occurred to me that employers tend to generally be unaware of the adverse impact caused by the use of facially neutral employment practices. This highlights the fact that even if employers want to do the right thing, they may not understand the disproportionate impact that their hiring tools can have on historically disadvantaged uh, groups. Hiring tools can disproportionately screen out members of a particular race, ethnicity, or gender groups are not new, but what's recently developed is this concern that we all have about the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. However, keep in mind that any hiring tool or employment screen can cause a disparate impact. It is extremely important that all hiring tools be held to the same clear standard 
developers and purchasers of such tools must understand the standard and they must be motivated to all of their outcomes. We've heard a lot of this discussion about the need for a, a structured audit and clearly stated parameters of such audits. And the standard actually already exists. It's the, uh, the federal standard for adverse impact uh, testing has been available since 1978 when EEOC and other federal agencies came together to publish the uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures. The uniform guidelines was designed to help employers understand how to comply with the Civil Rights Act and the uniform guidelines established that some hiring tests Although having an adverse impact on classes of workers such as African Americans could be considered acceptable if the test validity um, captures a bona fide work uh, qualification. My experience indicates that employers have generally focused on the job validity requirements of the uniform guidelines, whether that rather than measuring the possibility of the adverse impact of a hiring tool. Um, when, told that a, um, when told by a vendor that a test is valid, the employer does not question whether it's valid for their workforce or is validated for non-discriminatory requirements. This can lead to outcomes that are damaging to workers and employers alike. And I have a fear that your requirement of an annual uh, or a periodic audit by uh, the IT firms could have the same sort of- Time's impact. expired. Um, just let me close briefly by saying we also need to focus on the employer and how the employer is negatively impacted when they're using biased tests. An example I like to use on this one is um, comes from baseball. We have a great American parable from here. In 1947, the Brooklyn Dodgers reached out of their normal labor pool and Jackie Robinson became the first African-American baseball player. He batted 300 that year. He led the Dodgers to the World Series. Um, so we really have to, the continued use of a biased pool would damage the uh, Dodgers tremendously. And I, um, and it's important that we uh, get rid of the bias tools in order to help both the employer and the employees and the applicants. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now I want to turn over to Chair Holden for any questions for this panel. Uh, thank you all. This great, another great panel, but we had uh, so many great panels. Uh, Every one was, was terrific. And I want to thank you all. Um, I, I just want to say thank you, Mr. Edwards, for mentioning the Brooklyn Dodgers, my first love. Um, and and Jackie Robinson because I did I did go to Ebbets Field and I still love the Dodgers I don't I don't care they moved to L.A. Um, as John Paul Farmer knows he was in the Dodger organization and we talked uh, but but that was a I just want to thank you for that but I want to thank you all for your testimony your wonderful testimony and um, uh, Manish for your for your um, written testimony too it's it's some good information I started reading it I'm going to go back to it and uh, especially your recommendations I'm interested in. So uh, thank you. And uh, the wealth of knowledge on this uh, hearing has been amazing. And I wanna thank Majority Leader Cumbo for her, her bill. And um, it just, this hearing shows me that we need to move and move fast. Um, it, does anybody else have any questions for this panel? I do not see currently anyone raising the Zoom raise hand function. So I see no questions from other council members. Majority Leader, any more questions or any other comments? No, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say, um, you know, we're bringing up the names um, and I just want to give you a personal experience. Uh, I married a Japanese American uh, immigrant uh, in 1973. I married her when racism, this was post-war United States. And my wife's name is Yumiko, beautiful name, but we couldn't use it. We couldn't use it for job applications. We had a, you know, the family anglicized it to Amy. And now she's facing problems because her name isn't Amy Holden, it's Yumiko Holden. But we had to do it in order to get housing, to get jobs. And 
unfortunately, that was the case. And it's, it's, uh, it's very sad that that's still the case in 2020, that this bias exists, uh, even in a name, which is disgraceful. And that's why we need to have some controls over AI and, um, and, and certainly have safeguards against, against this kind of bias. So speaking from experience, um, racism is, is less blatant now possibly than it was in 1973, um, but it still exists. And that's why we need to, that's why we need to, this bill to and advance this bill and other bills that would give us more controls. But I would like to thank the administration and members of the public um, uh, and my colleagues for the questions. And particularly, uh, I wanna thank uh, the CTO, John Paul Farmer for listening to the public testimony. He was on this uh, entire uh, hearing. And um, I would especially like to thank uh, the, the staff of the Committee on Technology, uh, Committee Council Irene Bohovsky did a, as a poly, uh, you know, did a great job today uh, on this hearing. I know it, it's a stressful hearing, and I and I, you did an amazing job. And uh, Charles Kim, the po uh, the policy analyst, uh, all the preparation for this is this was a lot of work. Um, and of course, Florentine Gabor. Um, and my staff, Daniel Casino, who's sitting right next to me, and of course the city council sergeant at arms and staff for all their work on today's hearing. I think we accomplish a lot. Um, and Irene, I, I think you want to say something. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Beholden. I just want to say, if we have missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has not yet being called, please raise your Zoom hand function and we'll call you in order your raise hand function was raised. And I just uh, wanna thank you all again and turn back to um, Council Member Holden. I do not see anyone we missed, but I see that Majority Leader Combo would like to uh, make her remarks. Okay. I just wanted to close out by thanking Chair Holden for this committee. It was an honor and pleasure to work with you. This was a very enlightening committee. And when we think about the Black Lives Matter movement, which has really been a call for fairness, equality, and justice, you know, that happens in so many different ways. And the African American community throughout this country have always ushered in change for every other group. Um, in this country. And so when we answer the call to Black Lives Matter, you wouldn't automatically think of uh, the discrimination and the disparities and the lack of transparencies that are taking place in artificial intelligence. Um, but it's important that we recognize where systems of injustice can happen any and everywhere. So I wanna thank you for this opportunity to work with you. Um, I wanna thank my staff as well. Um, Alicia Mercedes, as well as Jason Herr, uh, and Tasha Young, my chief of staff, for all of their work, and for all of the panelists and everyone who gave of their time and energy today. Um, this is a really important subject and can make a huge difference um, in this country, um, because what happens in New York is uh, a precursor to what can happen in the rest of the nation. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Majority Leader, and thank you for your service for in, in this bill and many other, uh, you know, again, your your years of service to this city. And uh, hopefully this bill will advance quickly um, and we will see to it and um, become law. But uh, we need other bills like this. So I just want to thank you and thanks for this for staying on the call, uh, staying uh, on the hearing so long. And I wish you all a great weekend. And this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. <laughs>